you should be good to start. <laughs> well, I want to uh, welcome everyone to the April 12th, 2023 Open Space Board of Trustees meeting. We appreciate your participation. And I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, this is a, a couple things before we get into the bulk of the agenda. We've got a, a, a two important administrative tasks to do. We're going to administer the oath of office to our, our newest member, Brady Robinson. Oh, I, I think the audio might have cut out. Oh, now it's back. Uh, okay. Are we good? Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> so we'll we'll do that uh, and then get into the bulk, bulk of the meeting. Um, to start, I'm going to do a roll call of the members. Um, so, oh, Caroline is not here, right? Um, not just yet, I don't believe. Okay, Michelle? Here. John? Present. And Brady? Here. And I'm Dave, and we have a quorum, so we'll proceed. Uh, who's the Zoom host? I am. Okay, uh, Leah will uh, review the rules of the meeting for people participating on Zoom. Or not. <laughs> there it is. All right, here we go. Okay. So, hi, the city has engaged with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This vision supports physical and emotional safety for community members, staff, board and commission members, as well as democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experiences, and political perspectives. For more information about this vision and the community engagement processes, please visit the website listed on the screen. The following are examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code and other guidelines that support this vision. These will be upheld during this meeting. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intim intimidation against any person, obscenity, racial epithets and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. Participants are required to use the name they are commonly known by and individuals must display their full name before being allowed to speak online. Currently only audio testimony is permitted online. <clears throat> um, we have a couple people that signed up to speak um, in advance of this meeting when we do get to the um, public comment section will also have the option to raise your hand if you, if you would like to speak. You can find that by clicking on your participant box. Generally, it's in the lower left-hand side of your screen, um, but you can hover over the top or the bottom if you don't see it. But click on the participant box. There's three little dots, which will give you the option to raise hand. I didn't see anyone on the phone, but I can go over this again. Um, if you are on the phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand like to speak and I can go over that again when we get to that section. That's it. Thank you, Leah. <clears throat> uh, we're going to now administer the oath of office. So Brady, if you would read that out loud, uh, you will become official. I don't have to put my hand up before I do it. No. Okay. All right. I, Brady Robinson, do solemnly swear and affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America and the state of Colorado and the charter and ordinances of the city of Boulder and faithfully perform the duties of the office of a member of the Open Space Board of Trustees, which I am about to enter. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome again. Thank you very much. Looking forward to having you on board. Thanks. Uh, our next uh, item of business is to elect officers. And I'm just going to take a minute before <laughs> we do that and uh, to point out that whoever sits in, at the head of the table 
uh, there are great expectations for that position, so I will try to uh, to meet those. Um, I just wanted to uh, make a comment that there's a guy named John Nance Garner who uh, was Franklin and D. Roosevelt's uh, vice president for his first two terms in the 1930s and also was the speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives as, uh, in that role. And he pithily observed, uh, according to legend at least, that being vice president was about as worthless as a bucket of warm spit. And he, although he used a different uh, word for spit, but in, in any event, I do not feel that way at all. I think the, the, uh, the officers of uh, the board of trustees uh, have very important roles to play. And um, the community has entrusted uh, both the protection and sustenance of the open space lands and system uh, to the board of trustees and the officers um, certainly are expected to be leaders in, in that regard. And so I view the elections um, as extremely important. The role of the officers are outlined in the rules of procedure for the open space board of trustees. And with that, we will, or I will <laughs> open the floor to uh, nominations. There are three officers we will be electing this evening, uh, chair, vice chair, and secretary. So if uh, anyone has a nomination, uh, please make that. I would like to nominate Dave Coons as our board chair. Are there any other nominations? And uh, uh, are we just doing chair right now? Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, we so here, here's what I'd like to do, John. If we can uh, go through and get the nominations for all the uh, okay. officers, and then if there's a need to vote individually, we can. Um, if we want to just do a motion uh, to uh, elect that slate of officers, uh, we can do that. Do okay, need a second. I'll uh, oh, we don't need a second. We don't need a second. I'll, I'll nominate Michelle Estrella as vice chair. Great, thank you. Are there any other nominations? And the nomination for secretary. I will nominate uh, Leah Russell. <laughs> <laughs> See, I can remember. <laughs> um, Leah will be going on maternity leave shortly but has served uh, loyally and well for several years. And um, I think that the folks who will be helping in her absence will do great. And when Leah returns uh, from maternity leave, then she'll take the responsibilities if she is elected. <laughs> so, so are there any other nominations? <clears throat> Seeing none, can we have a motion to elect the officers that have been nominated? I move to elect the nominated officers. And we will need a second on that. Uh, I'll second that motion. Thank you. So it's been moved and seconded. Uh, so we'll go to a, a vote by acclamation. <laughs> um, if there is no opposition, um, then these are the officers who will be elected. Is anyone opposed? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, and we'll uh, look forward to the next year um, with the board. So thanks. Uh, so then um, we are moving on to approval of the minutes of the last meeting and Brady, you'll be very interested, but not able to vote. So you'll be abstaining. Um, so I'm looking for any corrections or additions to the minutes on page one. Seeing none, uh, page two, are there any additions or corrections? Seeing none, uh, page three, 
additions or corrections? Yeah, I just, I wonder whether we should um, insert my departure at 10.30 p.m. Shoot into the, into the minutes to formalize that. Good idea. Are there any other additions or corrections? So uh, we'll do a, a, another roll call vote on this. So the uh, minutes, uh, this is approval of the minutes as amended. Uh, Michelle? Yes. John? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So that is a quorum and that will carry. <laughs> and Brady officially abstains. Right. Thank you. Uh, now we are into uh, public comment. So public comment tonight, uh, will, uh, people can talk uh, with the board on any item that they want, but just uh, remember that there are no action items on tonight's agenda. So there will be no additional public comment on any of the agenda items. If you would like to comment on any agenda items, um, you should do so now during the public comment period. And uh, I don't know, Leah, do we still have a couple people signed up? So I think we'll, do, we'll stick with the three minute uh, rule. Um, and if anyone else uh, would like to speak, um, Leah, maybe you just quickly review uh, the process for that. I will. Thanks, Dave. The only two members from the public that are on are the two that signed up ahead of time. So I'm going to go ahead and start with them. And then I will offer that one more time with the instructions at the end. Anyway, I just asked, um, I'm sorry, I didn't notice this earlier, but I think that there is somebody who is here from the paragliding community who's about to speak. And, it, you know, we have a 15 minute block that's nested, um, you know, pretty late. And I was just wondering, if, is it possible to move that up for them if they wanted to watch it? And now they can watch it later. But I'm sorry, do you guys have a dirty look? Just an idea. Just an idea. I didn't. I should have thought of that earlier. But I don't know. It's only a 15-minute presentation, and so I don't know if we can shuffle it. Also, not uh, Dan, I would defer to you. Uh, well, Lisa there. probably would love that. <laughs> <laughs> She doesn't have to vote now. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Good looking out. Uh, That's a suggestion. I'd say. Happy to do There more. is no rhyme or reason tonight for the arrangement of the matters. Okay. Um, so, Janelle, on uh, the volunteer presentation, um, if we move the hang gliding, paragliding one in front of that, is that okay with you? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle. We we will do that. So that that will become under uh, matters from the department. That will be the first item. Perfect. Okay. So we'll do so we'll do public comment. And right. Okay. Right. So the two folks that signed up ahead of time, I have Dusty Miller and then Tom Isaacson. Dusty, I'll start with you. Give me one second to allow you to talk, and then Megan will pull up the timer. Okay, yeah, you should be able to. Can you hear me? I think I saw you pop on. Yes, we can hear you. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for having me and for, for doing this. I just wanted to quickly just um, thank uh, OSMP and Parks and Rec for all that they do for the community. Um, uh, just to, I, I'm, uh, I'm the Rocky Mountain Hang Gliding and Paragliding Association's communication manager, as well as the Boulder Site Director and a Boulder native, um, business owner, and pilot. Um, but yeah, just personally, it's been a pleasure to work with OSMP and Parks Department over the years. Um, and the RMHPA members are really eager to continue to work with the city. Um, RMHPA has around 300 active members now, and we're continuing to grow. And um, yeah, just a little background. We're an organization that works to preserve access and ensure landowners where necessary across Colorado. Um, the club's been active on the front range since the 80s and is the 12th oldest free flight club in the country. And um, we have a rich history of flying here on the front range and we're excited to continue to uh, make history and, and work together. So um, yeah, thanks thanks for all that y'all do and um, appreciate, appreciate you. 
Thank you, Dusty, for your comments. Would you mind uh, stating your name again, just for the record? Yeah, my name is Dusty Miller, or Dustin Miller, officially. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Dusty. Okay, Tom, let me switch you over. You should be able to unmute now. Okay. You can hear me, Leah? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, Tom Isaacson, 3165 Noble Court in Boulder. I'm speaking on behalf of the Boulder Climbing Community, and it's more than 1,000 members. I wanted to briefly follow up on the email you received a few days ago from Kate Beasley and Rui Ferreira regarding the uh, parking permit system for nighttime parking on Flagstaff Mountain from uh, 9 to 11 p.m. And I wanted to first, again, thank staff very much. We feel we have a great relationship with OSMP staff and the climbing community. We appreciate very much staff's willingness to develop this permit system and their willingness to give it another try for a second year beyond the initial one year pilot. We feel that's emblematic of um, the good cooperative working relationship we have. I think we all share the same goals here of reducing truancy and criminality on flag staff while also allowing responsible recreation up there. But we do have a specific suggestion to uh, on how to improve the system. The problem that was identified by staff previously and in their memo to you is that too few people are getting permits. And it strikes us, uh, frankly, at a fairly high level of confidence, that a large part of the problem here is that you have to apply for the permit at least seven days in advance. And for climbers, and I suspect for other legitimate users as well, it just doesn't work very well. Flagstaff is nice, but it's not the kind of destination that you plan more than seven days ahead that you're going to go there, whether at daytime or at night. I've climbed at Flagstaff a great many times, and never in all of that have I ever thought, you know, more than seven days ahead that that's when I'm going to be going to Flagstaff. And so we think that that restriction in the structure of this makes it unlikely you'll ever get the kind of usage numbers that you want to achieve. And instead of the current system, we have two suggestions. One would be to use the model that's used successfully for many years for off-trail permits and habitat conservation areas, where you just go online, agree to abide by the rules, and boom, you get your permit. And um, if staff is concerned that some people who are applying for permits might not fully understand the rules, you can embed that in the system where the person checks a box. I agree, no camping, check a box. I agree, I won't stay after 11 p.m., check a box, no alcohol or firearms, or bring to the person's attention any other rule that you want them to comply with. And I think that would serve both staff's needs and the user's needs. The other would be to uh, have the permit available seven days in advance, but have it operate for a longer period of time instead of just one day, make it for a month, a season, or something like that. I think an approach like that would be a win-win for both the users and for staff and achieve the goals that we're all trying to achieve here. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. It's good hearing from you and we appreciate your comments. Thanks, Tom. Okay, I think I will, I can't quite tell if, a couple more people popped on, so let me just give that one last call. So if you would like to speak, um, you can do so by clicking on your participants box. It's usually in the lower left side of your screen, um, but click on the participants box and then there's three little dots to, to use the raise hand function. Um, you can also send me a chat in the Q&A section. No takers. Okay. Uh, seeing no one else, uh, that will conclude the public comment period, and we will move on. Uh, our next item is matters from the board, and uh, there are three uh, in icebreaker, which uh, Janelle will lead us in in a minute. Uh, comments and questions from the trustees on the written information and appointment of a a uh, board representative to uh, serve on a city uh, working group. So we'll start with Janelle and an icebreaker. Hey, thanks, Dave. And um, 
Hello everyone, Janelle Freeston, Interim Deputy Director for Community Connections and Partnerships. And I also serve as Senior Manager for Volunteer Services, um, Volunteerism, um, Service Learning and Partnerships. And as volunteers, you all are volunteers as OSBT members, we consider you ongoing program volunteers. And a part of that is you work really closely together, right? And so a key piece in that is getting to know each other a little bit better. And this gives us a really nice opportunity tonight, Brady, with you joining the board to um, share some of these some of these questions that we've teed up for you. So we are gonna ask you, you can go around and say your name, including your pronouns, and then a fun fact about you. It could be something that you like to do in your free time, if you have any pets, anything about your family. Um, and then focusing finally on the OSMP system and really what about that you find interesting or inspiring. Maybe it's a trail, a natural feature on our system, um, a program area project. So it can be short, succinct, but just something that we can all get to know you all a little bit better. Do we have any takers who want to go first? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, sure. I'm Michelle Estrella. This is my um, third year on OSBT. I'm going on my third year. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And um, yeah, I love living in Boulder. I love all of the Boulder things. Um, and that includes trail running, not, not that I go very fast for any, or very far, um, climbing, um, skiing and snowboarding, mountain biking. Um, I'm also a mom of um, twin 11 year olds, a four year old cattle dog, and a approximately 10 year old tortoise. Who knows how old <laughs> um, it has, and it shall look to be like 80. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying that. Uh, that combination of, of um, family. Um, I, my kids are still open to me dragging them outdoors once a week so far. Uh, they are open to it. Um, you know, we, I, I love all things with the open space system. Um, and I, I just appreciate being, I just have a lot of gratitude for being able to serve on this board and contribute to our community in this particular way. Um, you know, I, I, I'm currently enjoying whatever my kids enjoy because um, it's less of a struggle to get them out <laughs> if they actually enjoy it. Um, and my daughter right now is into birding, so we're looking into getting involved in the raptor monitoring program. Yes. Thank you, Great. Michelle. Thanks. Brady, why don't you jump in and sure. Uh, Brady Robinson, uh, he, him. Uh, I have eight birds in my household. <laughs> Uh, three parakeets and uh, five chickens, three of whom are uh, very little and hopefully aren't roosters because that doesn't work in the city of Boulder. Um, and you, if you want to know the, the trials and tribulations of Stefan from last year, the, the rooster that I had and who we shipped in a box to Oregon, I'm happy to tell you about that. <laughs> um, we also have an old snake uh, or an old cat and a snake in my household. A fun fact, I think I've climbed the first flat on over 100 times the East Face. Um, I have friends who keep track. I don't, but I'm just going to give a rough estimate. Um, and I have to say that uh, having admitted that, I, I probably get in a little bit of a rut sometimes in terms of, of what I do do and don't do in, in the open space. And so I'm really excited to get to know more places, not just personally, but the issues and what went into them. And I'm probably one of those people that so often shows up at a place and just kind of take it for granted and don't know the full history and the fact that perhaps it was restored 10 years ago. And so I'm just really uh, interested in, in, in diving in. And I think the other thing I'm passionate about, which isn't something that maybe a lot of people are, is good governance. Um, I've been on a lot of nonprofit boards, I've been on the receiving end of a lot of nonprofit boards as an executive director. I've never served on a city board before. And I would like to humbly do my part to help support this whole entire organization and our decision-making public processes to be as, as great and as healthy as they can be. Great, thank you. Yeah. And we're looking forward to that as well. Okay. <laughs> John, would you like to jump in? Uh, sure, uh, my name's John Carroll. My pronouns are he, him. Um, my husband and I have three dogs. We have a Great Pyrenees, a Mastiff, and a Chihuahua cattle dog mix. And for anyone keeping track at home there, that's over like 200 pounds of dogs. We have a lot of dogs. <laughs> um, uh, named Charlie, Ralphie, and uh, Janeway, uh, if we have any Star Trek Voyager <laughs> fans here. 
Um, <laughs> in terms of uh, OSMP, uh, I, I uh, used to live up near Chautauqua, so the trails up there, it, it's really some of my favorite areas. And my husband and I got married on top of uh, Flagstaff Mountain, um, so that's really one of my favorite places in the whole system. John. Great. Thank you very much. No Caroline. No Caroline. Okay. I texted her. She says she's having Wi Fi connectivity issues and she's working on it. Oh, well, thanks. Yep. Great. Well, in that case, I'll jump in. Um, I'm Dave Coates. Uh, he, him, although that has never been an issue for me. Um, and uh, we moved to Boulder uh, 53 years ago. And when we first came here, we couldn't believe uh, what was then uh, Boulder Mountain Parks or what is now Boulder Mountain Parks. Uh, and, you know, what is uh, excellent, you know, superb uh, uh, action by a community to protect the natural environment around it. Uh, we, we were just uh, thrilled. The open space program was uh, kind of in its infancy then, uh, but uh, underway and um, you know, so we were aware of, you know, things that were going on around there. Uh, it's, it's become a very important part of my life uh, for three reasons. One is um, I really like getting out on the system. And some of my favorite trails are uh, Long Canyon and, and Fern Canyon. Um, and Fern Canyon, especially when you get on top of Bear Peak, you know, what an awesome view that you can see, you know, the Great Plains coming up against the Rocky Mountains. And it, it's just uh, awe-inspiring uh, every time. Uh, so that's been uh, particularly important. The other thing uh, is that we have, my wife and I have uh, two kids who are grown now, but both of them had, you know, tremendous experiences uh, in the Open Space and Mountain Parks program. Our son uh, was a junior ranger for several years and worked especially on the uh, Hogback Trail and the Hidden Valley Trail uh, at Boulder Valley Ranch. And uh, every time I'm on those trails, I, I think of him the, you know, and all the work that uh, they, that group put in uh, uh, that summer. And so that was, that's kind of neat. And our daughter uh, actually has uh, cerebral palsy, but she was her life was really saved by um, the therapeutic writing group at uh, Cherryville, and she got into that and uh, really connected with horses, and uh, that was really a, a lifesaver for her. It, it uh, was a bit of a financial burden for us because we end up having to buy two horses for her <laughs> over the years. But uh, she ended up uh, riding uh, in the, at the stock show and uh, the Colorado Open and uh, up in Fort Collins and stuff. And so, anyway, uh, they're both grown now, but um, I am greatly appreciative of uh, the, the therapeutic writing program that uh, is housed out at Cherryville. So, okay. Thank you. If if Caroline's able to join, then you know, yeah, we'll, let us know if we want her to do this now or later as well. So depending where we are in the agenda, right? We'll uh, if she gets on, we'll we'll fit her in at some point. Okay. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to <laughs> Leah. Um, as a reminder, as well, um, Leah's going to share. So as, again, as part of the board, you have your meetings here, and then also there are trainings that will be part of. Um, your, your volunteer experience. And so Leah will talk more about some diversity, inclusion, and equity trainings that the city has coming up that, again, we're going to remind as a board, we really highly encourage you to, to attend, particularly if you can all join together, right? Because we want to, wow, well, I'll let you continue, but we want to make sure we create a safe space for everyone. And, you know, I think sometimes unintentionally we might say things that could offend people. And so just making sure we're really teed up on that and we have, we're up on, yeah, everything, all the expectations. So. Yours would be more eloquent if you kept going than, oh. than mine, but um, super quick. But Brenda Rittenauer joined us a couple months ago to do training, and she talked about 
the work the city's doing in the DEI area, so diversity, equity, and inclusion. And there will be a series of, of various trainings. Um, the, the first one that we'll be doing is advancing racial equity. So I'm going to send out, or someone hopefully we will send out an email um, with more specifics on how to sign up. We would love if our board can do it collectively, um, ideally jointly with another board, but we'll send out those specifics um, in an email um, that will come from Brenda this week, we think. Yeah. Yep, so stay tuned for that. Great. Uh, we'll look forward to that. Yeah. Uh, thanks. That's, I think, an important uh, activity for the board to participate in. So. Great, uh, so we'll keep going. Um, the next item under matters is uh, any questions or comments that the board members have on their written information. Um, and there were three <coughs> items that were in the packet, the, an update on the Flagstaff nighttime parking uh, hours and permitting system, um, request for a sewer line across Skip Hired open space, and then, um, uh, a memo on the uh, open house that's upcoming uh, to present uh, activities, uh, management activities for the year. So um, let's uh, go down through those. If anyone has uh, comments or, or questions on the Flagstaff uh, nighttime parking uh, system uh, memo, now's a good time to ask those. Dave, can you clarify for me what was the difference between the, this portion of the meeting versus when it comes up later in the agenda and when we comment? Uh, it does not come up later in the agenda. Oh, this is it. This is it. Okay. Uh, so this is, yeah, the time for uh, questions and comments. Got it. Okay. So are, are there any? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll get started. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the flags. Oh, actually, before we talk about the Flagstaff nighttime parking issue, I just want for the record to, um, to state that while I professionally work for the organization, the Access Fund, um, I, I am representing my own opinions here as a citizen of the city of Boulder. Um, the Access Fund has not weighed in on this issue and will not weigh, on this issue, weigh in on this issue. So I just wanted to clarify that particular point. Um, and uh, yeah, so just, you know, looking at the memo, which I really appreciate and, um, and reading um, Kate Beasley's email along with listening to Tom Isaacson's um, uh, public input. I mean, I just, I kind of just wanted to zoom out a little bit because when I was reading the data, I just, you know, I, I, I wanted to like, it made me kind of question the assumptions around those um, addition, those expanded nighttime closures, and um, I'm just wondering what um, you know staff thinks. Do, do they think that this strategy is working um, of, of adding these additional hours, and why or why not? I can try and address that in the best way that I can. Um, Lisa Gonzalez, Recreation Management Coordinator. Um, and so this is a request from the Rangers because of the level of safety concern that they were experiencing up on Flagstaff after hours. Um, it's one tool that we have to try to limit nighttime use was to restrict the additional two hours. So transitioning from 11 p.m. to 9 p.m. for parking up on Flagstaff, um, it's one tool. It's the beginning, I think, of a process. And while we might not have seen that much success this year, I don't think it's going to happen overnight. And I think this is important to support the ranger um, effort to allow them to patrol more after hours. They're offered to extend their patrol time from 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. coming up in 2024, getting support from Boulder County Sheriff's Office to increase their presence up there. And so I agree the tool of changing uh, the nighttime hours uh, probably didn't do as much as we would have wanted to, unfortunately, um, but it's one, one piece of, I think, of a larger puzzle. Is there a reason why we can't have <clears throat> rangers um, patrol later at night? I know that's a, like a budgetary, which we'll, we will launch into um, budget discussions, but I, I know that they're typical hours and, and you've expanded it by an hour. There's overtime issues to deal with, but if it's something that we prioritized keeping that particular area safe, that that is some, something that we ought to seriously consider not just overtime, but adding additional staff to do that and not counting so much on the other law enforcement agencies. 
Is that something that we are also considering? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm just looking at who wants to dive in first. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 yeah, for sure. And, and Janelle, of course, is the, is the deputy over the Ranger Group. I can speak from a budget standpoint. So across our, our Ranger Group, we have <clears throat> 16 or so uh, full commission folks and an additional five temporary staff. And so we're really looking at shift scheduling. And so we've got two sides of the week with overlapping Wednesdays and looking at visitation data around when we're seeing peak visitors, what types of calls are we getting? And then what types of capacity do we need in order to respond to those calls? So we've got folks starting early and then other folks running late. Um, and it's really about uh, how many rangers should we have in service on any given time during those those peak hours, which do not tend to be right <laughs> 9 to 11 p.m. And so we're, we're looking at matching capacity, not to get ahead of ourselves, but in the budget process. One of the things we're going to be focusing on is these temp ranger positions, and they've been temp for a couple of years, and we have Affordable Care Act guidelines that keep those to nine months, and that presents some limitations in the way that we're able to use those folks to augment our post-certified rangers. So one of the requests you're going to see is actually to convert three of those uh, positions from temp into, into fixed term to try to augment capacity. Now, would that directly address 9 to 11 p.m. on Friday? <clears throat> we have a lot to do to figure out um, where we're going to be staffing those folks, uh, but that's just you're, everything you named is true. Uh, we're in a union negotiation year for BMEA, which is the union that the Rangers are in, um, overtime concerns, uh, budgetary concerns, and all of that. But I think one of our, our main strategic enhancements going into 2024 is what we refer to as presence on the land and making sure we have boots on the ground. So uh, you are echoing something that we think about very, very often. And obviously, there's to, to your point, there are many tools in the toolbox for how we're, how we're going to bring those things forward. But I don't know, Janelle, if you'd want to add anything. Thank you. I think you covered it really well. The only other thing I would Add is also looking at it <clears throat> holistically with all the other priorities they have as far as, for example, the early shift starts sometimes as early as 6 a.m. They're going out to look for unsanctioned camping on OSMP properties. So again, it's just going into what Lauren was saying, like trying to balance all those competing priorities for the ranger work group for yeah, the issue-based things as well as being on the system with, with regular patrol. I would also say the first year of implementation mm -hmm. of this program was also one where our ranger staff got hit pretty hard with uh, uh, several rangers on light duty, meaning they had injuries that uh, had them be more office based instead of field base. We had some leave uh, folks on maternity leave, paternity leave. So it was a, a little bit of an odd year for rangers that overlapped this period in which that also presented limitations of beefing up uh, this overtime late shift. Uh, so we weren't at full capacity for uh, a good part of this overlap. So that's why we're looking forward to completing a full year, uh, the rest of the year of 2023 and coming back to the board with additional data that we could bring forward that might inform some decision making around this. So. Uh, I've got questions. So, uh, um, similar to, thank you for that. And um, similar to Michelle, it, I was just reading the memo and it's like, well, there was murder, criminal activity, all these terrible things. And so we're going to Put in parking restrictions, and it's kind of like, mm. so what's the theory of change? Is, is it just the fact that when there's no parking allowed, you know by definition the cars that are there shouldn't be there, and it just makes it easier to focus? Because one could say that, you know, the, the people who abide by the parking restrictions are the ones who are paying the price, and people who are going to be doing all those sorts of things don't really give a hoot. So is, is that how it helps the rangers? Is, yeah, and the sign itself is a visual visual reminder to say that when someone parks there, they, they find the person that's in the vehicle, either they're in there or they have to go chase them down um, away from their vehicle. And it's a visual reminder that, you know, you parked here, the sign says you're parked here in violation of that. And so it, that is a tool. Like I said, it's, it's one tool. Um, one of the goals of the Rangers being able to extend their, their after hours patrol to 10 p.m., is that they'll be able to quote unquote clear the mountain. And so starting at the five point mile mark at Green Mountain Summit, starting contacting everyone there, making their way down. Unfortunately, by the time they make their way down, they're usually have a warrant arrest. They have something that probably holds them up to be able to do it multiple times in an evening, especially if you're doing it for an hour. And so signs are one tool, um, but that is the goal of being able to have that uh, presence during that time. So the, uh, the enforcement presence on Flagstaff, uh, I mean, ultimately it's responsibility of the Sheriff's Department. Is, is that correct? 
Curtain yes, just joined. Yeah. <laughs> Good timing. <laughs> you might want to repeat the question for him when it cuts out when he yeah. switches over to a panel. Yeah. yeah. We'll give Burton a second. Because he can explain more. Hey, Burton. <laughs> yeah, he's on. So, Bird, my question is, uh, as far as enforcement presence at night on Flagstaff, um, we don't see a lot of the sh sheriff's department personnel there either. Is, is, is that right? Even though aren't they ultimately responsible for enforcement? That's correct, Dave. They are ultimately responsible for that. Um, they have faced um, critical um, shortages in their staffing and they're uh they've struggled to maintain their presence throughout the county so um but that is something on my on my list to check in with them to see um if we can uh have more regular patrol of the area from them this year because if we got rid of the permit system which i think you know was one of the considerations you know proposed or not, not proposed but uh, uh, in the memo um and we just do no parking, so no parking from nine until five. Uh, and when we look at the data, the signs don't seem to be working all that effectively. So then what? Well, I, I would also say that some of this, for some of the visitors, it's going to be a culture, it's not going to change overnight. The other thing that we brought up when we uh, brought up the whole, when we first were enacting this, is we went and, and talked about all the other agencies and where they're at, including the Walker Ranch and those trailheads that are just above our system. All those tend to be uh, dusted on. Um, and so even when you look at all the other parts of the year, maybe not June and July, or is even more, is even a little bit liberal. So that was another factor too that, that that our trailheads in these areas don't become a destination uh, for some some folks that want to use our our trailheads in non recreation based ways. Um, and Burton, I don't know if you want to comment, but I know that when we brought up the issue uh, more robustly when we first were talking about changing the parking restrictions to be more consistent with our open space partners, the rule itself and the signage provides the rangers more ability than to be able to approach visitors because of that 9 p.m. ordinance change, I believe was one of the reasons too. And I don't know if, if I'm correct in that, or if you maybe want to elaborate on why it's important just to have uh, that, that ordinance change in and of itself to provide rangers with, that, with a tool. You nailed it, Dan. That that's the main one of the main reasons for us is that it does allow us to engage in clearing the mountain sooner um, in the evening, and so it's again just works. It's it's a benefit for us to be able to start that clearing process earlier in the evening. Um, yeah, and the area is a regional draw. Everybody is familiar with that, but you know the the when we check in with people you know they are from all over the front range um within view of the flat irons if you can see them they're coming i think uh, kate mentioned in her email that I mean, we we need to have more enforcement and i know that's hard to do with um labor constraints and all um and i'm just wondering if we thought a little bit out of the box about this because um you know, I, I live in South Boulder and um, I shop at the, the Table Mesa King Stickers and there are two mall cops there all the time. And what they actually do, I, I don't know, they make people feel safer, but it's also a deterrent. Um, and um, that, hey, we're watching you every time you come into the store. And that's not just um, the King Stickers, it's like every, every store, the grocery store here in town. So, <clears throat> the, you know, these, um, Stores have implemented this. Is this is this some, something that I know that they wouldn't have the ability to enforce, but them standing out there and driving up and down Flagstaff is, is that something that we consider to uh, you know attempt not a, a city or county employee, but somebody who can patrol and just be a deterrent. So you mean like running a security company? 
I'm not sure if we've ever have we. I mean, it's come up in conversation, but I don't know if we've ever like looked into how we could. Yeah, we're like looking at each other. Oh. <laughs> yeah. We've done that on specific trail construction projects where we had safety concerns about folks coming in. We've hired third party or flaggers or things like that to keep folks off. I think part of the idea with bringing on that temp crew, we've had that for three years now, four years now. Um, those folks are limited commission and and are not full commission, but had had that ability. Uh, we, we've focused the the staff capacity on weekends and high visitation areas. And so they're, they're able to, um, to flex kind of that, the capacity that we had with the ranger group. So, uh, no, I, I think, I think we certainly ha have options around hiring contractors and vendors. And again, it was just really about how do we, in, in the whole world of the things the rangers are responding to start to prioritize where to, where to put those dollars and those people. And, um, uh, and this is, you know, it was a pilot a pilot year with one thing in the toolbox and I, I don't I don't think I think a, a lot of staff would agree with and, and echo a lot of the comments that we've heard we've heard. So that is it's all very well taken. Well I would say Burton you might want to comment that when you're making the strategic decisions of lining up risk with appropriate capacity, I believe where the Rangers have landed as far as nighttime uh, patrols is that you're doubling up uh, based on safety concerns and what we're dealing with on a typical evening up there, that it's just not one ranger on their own. And it's not a temp ranger. In fact, it's two fully commissioned rangers based on the type of its incidences that we come across on the mountains. So the idea of something much less than that may be a concern, but I, I don't know if you want to just comment on on how you are deciding what type of uh, capacity you want to be putting up um, in terms of capability. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, to your point, we have them up. They're they're up there together, but they might be independent, like they may be in different vehicles working together um, in the same area. But yeah, we've, we've thought that was uh, an important starting point to have the fully commissioned officers up there. With the temp staff, though, they they do help. Their their presence during the day is is pretty valuable throughout the system. And flag staff is one of those key areas that we focus our attention on. Um, and so both uh, temps during the day and and full time staff during the day it gets regular visits. So we are aware that that deterrent can can help. Yeah, so I, I just would like us to think about the, the people who are trying to do the right thing. They're trying to get a permit. They're trying to recreate lawfully. And um, by by having these restrictions that make it near impossible, even with a well-tooled um, parking permit program, which I think we have a long way to go to make it well, um, you know, well run so that it's actually usable. Um, but, but just question that assumption in general, like what, should we even be, um, and this is a pilot, and I know that we changed the ordinance, but we always said that we would adaptively manage both directions. Um, if something wasn't working, we would consider, um, you know, um, you know, not just making things more um, strict, but also loosening up and revisiting the assumptions. So, you know, we, there are people who want to recreate out, recreate out there legally, and um, we certainly want them to be out there um, and possibly diluting, um, you know, or, you know, by having an honest presence out there, diluting and the possibility that it will be criminal activity. It, you know, it's been proven a lot of cities that the more uh, restaurants and the more people you have going through those, actually, the crime actually goes down. And so I would love for us to also keep um, thinking about that. Let me ask this, is it the sense of the board the, on two things? One is that it, it's, worth uh, continuing a second year of the pilot permitting program, uh, but also looking at an HCA permit type of arrangement, which has been suggested. Is, it, is that a fair statement for the board? I was to, curious to hear from staff if the HCA methodology would be yeah. feasible in your all's view or not. That was the question. I, yeah, no, yeah. yeah, I can address that. Yeah, so uh, I'm Sam McQueen, Business Services Senior Manager. Nice to see you all. Um, so we, in this pilot year, were really focused on collecting data, figuring out what the kinks are in the process, 
And so this was a very early issue that we identified. Um, we certainly wanted to look at faster ways to issue the permit. And so um, when we went out and tried to figure out what guidelines there are for parking already on the system during the day and what we needed to do to actually issue the permit, the best way that we could do this was to have a permit that would be displayed on the dashboard for our vehicles. Um, so we're looking at pro uh, permitting the vehicle and not the person. So for our habitat, habitat conservation areas, HCAs, which do have an auto issue permit, we're permitting the person. They have the ability to actually have the permit on their phone. So if they um, are out there, they can show their permit on their phone. With the vehicles, we had to actually have something displayed on the car. And so that prevented us from doing an auto issue. We needed to allow some time for printing, things like that. We know it's not a perfect system and we definitely want to reassess that. Um, and so seven days was the, the fastest turnaround we could come up with to be able to make sure that we could get permits out to folks. Um, but again, it is an issue that we've identified and we, we know it's something that we would like to improve. Just as it compares to some of our other permit, we have daily and annual parking permits, commercial and special use permits. A lot of what the city has tried to do, and we've talked about it in previous budget cycles, is shift us to enterprise citywide um, permitting systems, which involve creating logins and submitting trip reports and a lot of things that um, require review and approval and capacity in a way that some of these auto issues don't. Um, and so we, we certainly on, on our team and business services have staff who are reviewing things every day. Some of our other programs like commercial and special use, we build in leave no trace quizzes and things that Tom was alluding to in his comments. Um, what we've seen a lot in the applications are uh, in the applications, folks indicating they will be camping. And so, you know, that there, there's all this follow up and engagement back and forth, right? When we're seeing, with the ones that we're seeing be submitted. So we're absolutely open to the feedback and suggestions. We agree that seven days is is time is time consuming and, and and not aligned and we're trying to be mindful of of what the tools that the city's on the tools that the city's onboarding the tools they're trying to expire that hca auto issue system is like 23 years old and so we're looking at can we even continue to support the back end of that from a technology perspective so those are some of the things going on behind the scenes as we try to think about how to make this a better experience i we agree with you <laughs> that seven days is not a great experience. I time's time. idea of having it last a month versus a day. Yeah, look at that? so we did consider that. Um, we had early requests for that and so looked into it a little bit more. I think to the point of we really needed to collect data and try to understand what the use of the system would be or what the use of the permit would be. Um, we needed to know what folks were going to be doing each time that they were out there. Um, and so it's, again, something that we thought of to reassess in the future, but for now we really needed to just understand, you know, were they going out for climbing, were they going out for hiking, and so a blanket permit wouldn't give us those answers right away. So what's the time frame for your review? It's seven days right now. No, 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 no I mean for the, the oh, permit the process of the in pilot. general. Apologies, yeah, so we, um, so we had done, uh, had committed to doing two reviews in a one-year cycle, and so Aside from just conversations where we're making sure that we're meeting and talking about the issues, we had more formal review sit downs twice. Um, and we were trying to do that within a one year cycle. What we've now said is that we'll continue it through the rest of the year um, so that we're you know, making sure that we're continuing to collect that data. Um, we, you know, you, you saw in the memo, our recommendation is that we don't continue because of that. If we see something very different this year, uh, we'll we'll come back together and have a conversation about it. But, you know, to the point of, uh, we know that people were not applying because of that seven day limitation. We, we recognize that also, but uh, we, we really were looking at it trying over that one year cycle. Does it make sense uh, for the board to get an update uh, sometime later this summer or something as far as how things are going? I'm going to work with my colleagues up for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did want to take the opportunity to share that um, I've been talking with Ruri throughout 2022 to make the FCC president to make sure that we're in line and that we're providing enough support. We don't want to needlessly uh, displace passive recreational use for, for no good reason. Um, and so there are frequent check ins between him and myself, and he takes it back to the board. Um, that said, I think. Uh, 
we we weren't sure when we were having conversations if this was in fact negatively impacting the community. Um, he wasn't hearing any negativity coming from boulders that they were being displaced or that they were frustrated with the process. And so I just wanted to echo Tom's sentiment that we we do value our working relationship with the climbing community, our in constant communication. Um, based on their feedback, we did decide to continue the permit process for an additional year. And we would like to have that full year to be able to process the information that we get. And we can touch back with the board probably at the end of the year. Uh, summertime is gonna be the busiest time in theory for, for boulders to be out there when the daylight hours are a little bit extended. And so if there is an opportunity uh, to show that there was an increase in permits, I wanna make sure we give that enough time. And <clears throat> John's got his hand up. He's John, being really hey, John, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you want to jump in? I, I, I did. You, you all covered a lot of the great points. You know, I, I was going to ask about Kate and Tom's point about the the HCA permits and how easy they are. Having lived up near Flagstaff, you know, I, I was thinking about wanting to go up there. It was never a place I was planning. You know, uh, a week out to go hiking at or you know, to go do something in the evening. So thinking about how we could accommodate that, I imagine that turned folks off or any way we could offer longer term permits um, seems seems interesting as well and a potential solution, especially if we're having to print off, you know, parking permits uh, for cars, which makes sense. So just, uh, you know, kind of agreeing with everyone else there. Great, thanks. Uh, well, from a staff perspective, we got a lot of good feedback right a lot of them um, and of course we have the formalities of checking them but then there's a, always after board meeting review in which we get together and say what are we here and so the team will huddle on everything we heard tonight and um, we'll, we'll uh, check back in with you uh, this fall sometime on this that, that sounds good and uh, as kind of the uh, ending comment, I, I want to make sure that staff knows that uh, the board really does appreciate the efforts that you're uh, putting in and um, you know, trying to address the situation. And as Brady and others have pointed out, um, it, it's a ma major issue safety-wise for both visitors as well as staff. And um, we want to make sure that uh, everyone is safe uh, so that um, hopefully we can come up with uh, a solution that will help us uh, do that. But we, we do appreciate the efforts that are being put in. And uh, I think we're kind of on a, on a good path uh, to hopefully uh, figure some of this out. Thanks. Uh, with that, um, let us go to the second item um, was the request for a sewer line uh, extension onto Gebhardt. Um, did anyone have any questions or comments from the, uh, from the memo information on that? The only, the only thing I question is it looks, it looks like the, the sewer line extension just abruptly ends. And I'm assuming that there's actually a sewer line that That's right. That's it connect, it connects to. So it would be nice on the map if actually we could get the sewer line. Yeah, you could kind I, of see the location of the sewer line. I and, think that might be attachment B. Let me just pull that up. Yeah, I did. I didn't, my eyesight isn't very good, but I didn't see a sewer line on, on that. Yeah, I think it might be. Hi, Dave. But, this is Bethany, um, real estate senior manager. Yes, there is an existing city sewer main in uh, under our Gebhardt open space property, pre existed our ownership. And so it would be, if the connection uh, were considered and approved, it would be uh, connecting to that existing sewer line. And we will uh, make sure our maps uh, reflect that in the upcoming that, memo. That'd be great. Right, so are there manholes along the existing uh, sewer line? Yeah, so Gebhardt? the end of where you uh, see the connection, there is an existing, the proposed connection, there is an existing uh, manhole, yes. Okay. Yeah, no, that'd be helpful. I think just to have everyone understand that, okay, here, here's what we're trying to get, or here's where we're trying to get to. Thanks. That sounds right. Uh, any other comments? Okay. Um, and then the last uh, item, um, Dan is going to help me out on this, but there's been a request from the city manager 
uh, for board participation on a pilot working board working group uh, that she is envisioning for the uh, step two of the Boulder Junction uh, project. And uh, she's requesting uh, board uh, representation in there. I have accounted, but there are a number of boards that are involved in this project and open space being one. And Dan, maybe you can just jump in and fill us in real quickly on kind yeah. of your sense of uh, what that role would be. Yeah, so this is sort of a site planning project for the city of Boulder. I believe uh, planning is uh, the lead department on this uh, within the city of Boulder limits. Um, there's 11 potential boards that could touch this particular planning effort. And so in looking at how we could do this effectively for both the board and commission's perspective, the community's perspective, staff perspective, the city manager is putting together a pilot project in which uh, uh, she's suggesting that a representative, uh, a single representative from all these 11 boards be sort of appointed to sort of, uh, and those board members would receive some enhanced information and their sort of their duty would be to kind of bring it back to the boards. Uh, they would be getting some more timely updates like staff would normally do. So it's a way to how can we make the board and commission involvement process a little bit easier for everyone involved. So it's a little bit of a pilot project in which 11 boards will each have a single representative on a particular project. And perhaps if this goes well, it could be used in other citywide efforts that have this sort of big involvement. So open spaces, are, you know, we have a kind of a very small uh, set of issues out here. We have some open space other uh, land designations out in this area, some small slivers. So I think that's why we are identified as as, as probably uh, having some potential board involvement. I mentioned to Dave earlier that the open space other particular issue might have a decision-making path that runs parallel to this, to this planning effort as well. And so um, anyway, a small little lift for open space, but yet a nice pilot project that the city it's as a whole is trying to undertake by having representations from uh, a single representation from all these 11 boards. So that's the idea. Great. And yeah, uh, just a reminder, the, the open space other, the OSO designation uh, certainly is, comes before the board whenever there's any kind of planning uh, decision that uh, might affect that. And as many of the board members probably remember, sometimes those get to be somewhat controversial um, or at least complex. And so it'd be, it's nice to have a board representative kind of early on in, in those discussions so that uh, it doesn't appear that we're coming in a little late in the game. So uh, I have checked with uh, Michelle and John um, on what their interest in being the board representation. And John uh, has graciously agreed to do that. So I am officially appointing John to be uh, the board's representative uh, to the Boulder Junction Phase Two Project Board Working Group. And hearing no uh, thank objection, you, Dave, uh, John, uh, you uh, <laughs> we, we have high expectations for your role. <laughs> so anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to make everyone proud. <laughs> and well, we appreciate uh, your willingness to do that. Um, and I don't know whether Caroline is still on, but uh, a reminder, she is uh, remains the board rep to the Greenways program. Um, and I'm not aware that we had any uh, uh, meetings or issues with that of late, but um, she, so we periodically ask board uh, members to represent the board in various capacities. And this is an example of one. Does that continue on in this next cycle? Does we need a reappointment or? Well, um, I'm gonna, or I don't know, maybe. Yeah, I think Dave and you served in that capacity right. two or three years ago right. in which that board used to actively meet at least once a year. The last couple of years they, ha uh, they have not. Well, uh, Katie Knapp at the, that time was the kind of the Greenways project coordinator. Yeah. And so she's managed to come over to Open Space. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Utilities is, still has a Greenways uh, 
program coordinator. Right. Um, but I have not heard. Yeah, I, I could single back out. And usually they do that around the budget time. So uh, early summer would right. typically be when any action is taken. And, and at that time, Dave, you would report back and say, here's right. sort of what the budget's looking like. And, and their pro what specific projects might have there be on uh, open yeah. space. Yeah. And of course, staff monitors that as well. But uh, I'll get back to the board to see if, if there's going to be any action. Uh, I served on that previously when I was at Parks and Rec. Okay, great. They don't meet very often. <laughs> <laughs> Once a year, usually, maybe twice. But. So thanks. That uh, concludes the agenda items under matters. Are there any other matters from the board that we need to consider? <clears throat> Hearing none, uh, I think we're ready to go, Dan, to matters from the department. And I'll just say you're off to a, a great start, Dave. <laughs> seven oh seven at a seven ten um, agenda. Let's keep it up. We have two minutes just to talk. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. um, we have uh, three uh, three main items from matters of the department, and then there's some verbal updates at the end. But uh, I always look forward to this April meeting because it's it's somebody when we bring a new volunteer on the board. This typically we have this be the time when we actually honor our volunteers and uh, do a presentation in, a, in, a, in a, an important program area of ours, and that's volunteerism uh, and service learning and partnerships in which we have built a program and a work group over in which Janelle Freeston is, uh, leads. And uh, so typically we'll... <laughs> so that intro. <laughs> Thank you, Janelle. That was very good. All right. So I'm not going to repeat all that okay, in about fine. 15, 20 minutes from now. So, yes, you're right. We are going to go right to the Rocky Mountain Hang Gliding and Paragliding Association MOU, and Lisa Gonzalez is going to take that away. <laughs> Looks like I'm not allowed to share my screen. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> might make the presentation a little bit more oh, exciting. <laughs> at seven. Yeah, oh, at seven oh nine. This oh. is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. Um, yeah. Mainly because I don't know what I would change for you, Lisa. So how about yeah, that's I fine. your presentation? That'd be great. Um, can you do that now? Let's see. Yes, I can. Okay. Let's pretend it was. Sorry good. about that. <laughs> yeah, you did great. Thank you, Sam. Let me just get this going. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Lisa Gonzalo, Recreation Management Coordinator for City of Boulder Open Space and Mountain Parks. I'm very excited to talk to you today about the Rocky Mountain Hang Gliding and Paragliding Association and to seek the board's recommendation for a three year memorandum of understanding with this group. I wanted to start by differentiating a little bit between what a paraglider is versus a paramotor. Um, and so paragliders are non-motorized. They meet the definition of a passive recreation activity. Um, they've been flying in the front range on open space property for uh, decades, founded in 1975. Um, essentially, they are silent. They're carried in a backpack, about 60 pounds worth of a kite in there uh, by a hiking pilot and where they launch from our designated launch sites. Uh, different than a paramotor depicted on the bottom right hand side. Uh, these are use gas powered engines that turn a propeller. Uh, they're very loud, they're very heavy, and you cannot hike with them. They require a truck or small trailer to transport in. And so these are prohibited from launching and landing on open space. And so for the purposes of this presentation, we'll be talking about paragliders. So if they don't have a motor, um, how are they moving? And that was something that I have learned uh, working with this group. It's fascinating. Um, the most common way for a paraglider to get lift is by using thermals. Um, so as the sun warms the ground, the ground warms the air directly above it. This happens more quickly in areas where there's a lot of surface heating, like the flat irons. Uh, they create strong thermals early in the day because they have a more direct angle to the sun than the ground. And for this reason, the front range is regarded as a paraglider superhighway. 
So par pilots are known to fly uh, very regularly from Bolden, Boulder to Golden and back. Golden has uh, the other very popular launch and land site that's been designated through Jefferson County open space uh, up on Lookout Mountain. Experienced pilots can fly to Colorado Springs, Fort Collins, uh, and even Wyoming in a single push. Very impressive. Let's talk about the designated launch and land areas that we have here on open space. To orient us, we're south of Lee Hill Road, north of Wonderland Lake, and west of Foothills Community Park. The green depicts open space and mountain parks property. The blue are the designated uh, launch sites. There's a designated handy, um, gliding access trail to both. Uh, unfortunately, this map doesn't show, but there is a designated uh, trail that leads to that uh, bottom left-hand corner uh, launch site. Um, the landing site is on Parks and Rec's property at Foothills Community Park, depicted here in the pink. And there is some overlap between uh, the landing sites and the soccer fields one, two, and three at the park. And so every year uh, we coordinate to send the soccer schedules to the pilots and that way we are able to avoid any conflict. A little bit about the Boulder pilot community and who they represent. Um, it is still predominantly uh, a male driven activity, but there is a rapidly growing female pilot community as well at 18.4%. 60% uh, of pilots, roughly, are between the ages of 20 and 39 years old. 15% fly Boulder over 100 days a year, and 66.5% of their respondents have been flying for three years or less, so definitely uh, a growing um, opportunity. If you've ever sat down with, with Dusty or any of the RMHPA members, you immediately uh, get their enthusiasm and excitement for their activity. And they carry that excitement into trail work days. And Bo, who's sitting behind me, can, can attest. He works uh, directly with this group. And so every year they coordinate a uh, trail stewardship uh, gathering. 2019, they had 38 volunteers. It's gone down a little bit, uh, 2022. They had 26 volunteers. They restored 180 feet of widened trail on the Wonderland Hill Gliding Access Trail. And so they do exemplify what we look for uh, and what we really appreciate in a recreational stewardship group. A little bit of the history. Um, as I said, they've been flying from Open Space and Mountain Parks property for, for decades. Um, we had our first MOU signed in April 29th of 2019. That actually established uh, their landing sites on Parks and Recreation property, whereas before uh, that, that wasn't formalized. And so that was a big part of that three-year MOU. Uh, during the pandemic, we asked for a one-year extension to be able to discuss with RMHPA where we were, what opportunities there were, where we were missing um, some, some thoughts. That we wanted to make sure we made that time to have those discussions with them. We met in October and they're a wonderful group. We talked about top landing, which ended up getting approved. And so a little bit about top landing. It's a safety measure that they advocated for. It allows them to land back on the launch sites. So they would launch. If something is amiss, the weather is off, something happens and they need to land again. They don't think they can make it to the designated landing site. This allows them to land back on those launch sites. Um, and they also asked to be able to practice this activity. And so we permitted that as well. Um, this was in line with Jefferson County also allowing them to top land. Um, so we thought that was an important safety measure and we were happy to include that. Other than um, some additional in insurance indemnification clauses, we did talk about some additional sites. It's a growing, it's a growing activity. Um, and like I said, they are wonderful to work with. Uh, they, they give back and we wanted to open the opportunity to expand or explore uh, what different sites uh, could be um, utilized. Unfortunately, the sites they recommended, we couldn't approve because they were already uh, not approved in other planning processes. They included private property. Um, so there were just some things amiss with uh, the sites that they proposed. Um, what we did decide on was to have a longer conversation just to better understand what does a good launch and land site look for for you? What are you looking for geographically from weather patterns, from wind direction? And so we learned a lot and took a lot of great notes. And so that was in October of 2022. Um, so I count that as the beginning of a conversation that we hope to continue, uh, which leads us to today. So April 29th, 2023 is when uh, our one year extension from 2022 will expire. And so we are looking for the board's recommendation to 
it was on the three-year MOU. And that concludes my presentation. So does the MOU get signed by the Proud Board or just opens, or not signed, um, get presented to the Proud Board or just OSBT? It doesn't. Um, it did go to Prab in 2019 because of the formalization of the landing sites on Parks and Rec property. This year, there were no substantive changes as far as the Parks and Rec side of it goes. And so they were considering it as a renewal. So it doesn't have a requirement to go to Prab. And what did you do prior to 2019? Uh, you know, they, they've been flying here for a long time. What what was the impetus in, in, in developing that? I know it was, it was formalized for landing on the Parks and Rec land, but they've, they've been flying and landing. So yeah. and what caused you to develop the MOU to begin with? I mean, for the first time just four years ago, if they've been doing this for decades on our land. I think it was something that was identified. I didn't I didn't formalize it, so I, and I, I can only just say what I know, um, but it, it formalized our partnership with this working group. And so it provided for safety measures. They they put up a, a windsock uh, every time they go flying. And so it kind of set like, well, what are the parameters? You can't have guidelines. You can't have this. Um, you are required to check on it and make sure that it's in functioning good order. Um, it established the launch and land sites. How, do you, how are you going to get there? How are, we, how are you going to get to some of the accesses are a little bit more difficult to, to arrive at. And so more than just the, I think, approving the landing site, uh, it was just a formalization of our partnership. So it wasn't, did, there wasn't any adverse event that sort of, that we need to lay down the law. It was, yeah. Um, and then, um, so you, you started talking about renewal probably prior to October 22. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, but um, but October is when you met, last met. Yes. And you've been corresponding about the MOU in between and city. Uh, I think Janet Michaels has signed yes. off. You've all, you've all worked on that. Um, so thanks for that. That background. Um, when you, you talked about the, the different sites and it's been like, you know, six months since you talked last or you're you, you seem open to having that conversation. Do you have any other um, meeting set up with them to kind of pursue some of their the, the other ideas they have um, perhaps around um, maybe it's new launch or landing sites or whatever but or or just you know perhaps making better the uh, improving the the launch sites uh, have are, are you um, do you have anything scheduled in, in terms of continuing that conversation or is it I'll be, I'll call you later. You know, is, is oh, just yeah. to make sure that the, this is actually something that you know um, gets people's attention, and they're not just said, you know sent off for the next three years. Yeah, that's definitely not our intention to 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 blip service and, and send them off for three years. I think this was the big push, um, getting this MOU uh, agreement for another three years and ongoing conversations from that. And so we have been emailing back and forth. It takes a lot of coordination between the city attorney, risk management, uh, parks and recreation. And now we have a new uh, RMHPA president. And so bringing her on board as well, catching her up to speed, and which I know the previous president made a point to, to take some good notes. And so we can kind of pick up where we left off with Olivia. Um, and so that is the intention that we will continue the conversation kind of as soon as this piece is, is wrapped up, re-engaging. So what's the process? So let's say you and I have a conversation and I come with some proposals. Uh, what happens at OSMP when someone comes with an idea? I mean, I know we got the West TSA, the North TSA, which are in okay. here. Where, where does it go up the chain and when does it come down? And is there an appeal process or like, uh, uh, um, how does it work? For, yeah. for a beginner here like me to this whole situation? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm learning as I go as well and process is something that um, can change. So historically, this has gone through uh, planning review. And so when the North TSA happened, uh, the planners in charge of that process reached out to RMHPA and asked them for if they had any opportunities they'd like to consider, and then they go from there. Um, so that was their main bite at the apple, in other words, the North mm -hmm. TSA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, you want to add? Yeah, well, yeah and oh, <laughs> Grady, you know, one, one of the Lisa's position uh, created in 2019, uh, rec management coordinator was a brand new position for us. So recognizing that you basically, you went right to the planning process and, and went to a planner who was maybe, a, we realized that there needed to be more day-to-day -day outside of an individual planning effort to have a conduit to various groups. And that's why Lisa's position was actually created and we established a rec management 
uh, program area within OSMP to help sort of enhance that ability for us to have more ongoing continual conversations with groups and Better not just wait year cycle. not just wait for a planning <laughs> effort to take yeah. place. So that's really the kind of the purpose of what Lisa does. And and this is one association and one outlook that she does, but she is sort of a conduit for, for that, it. as well as our planners and any other staff that would have a reason to have associations or contacts with it. But we officially established that program area to sort of address that question yeah. that you're raising. And so and Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and just just one other lens, and I think it gets to what you were alluding to as well, Michelle. So um, we look at what the appropriate permitting process is for each of these things that comes up. So when we were looking at this years ago, is commercial and special use the appropriate forum? Um, that's specifically for folks who are generating revenue off of the system that doesn't apply in this case. And so then we're we're in more of an MOU partnership framework. And that's something uh, we talked about Thorn last year where we ran into a similar thing where the partnership and the way we're engaging goes much beyond like a, a commercial transaction. And so we're building out this MOU framework and I would anticipate that that's something that we actually see more often now at, at this board. In this regard though, the North Trail Study Area is certainly provided a context uh, for this. Is that not right? It yeah, did. And I would say also the Southern Grasslands and the Eldo Dowdy Draw TSA, because those right. also had historical launch sites in them that were considered as part of the planning process. And actually the sites that they had brought forward in the last couple of years were sites were those same sites from those mm -hmm. previous planning processes, but it had been enough years ago that the, the current staff hadn't been involved in those conversations. So a lot of it was kind of pulling back up the information and the conversations that we'd had previously so that everybody kind of understood what evaluation had gone through right. that. So I guess I'm just trying to let you know, Brady, that there's been a planning context that these areas and this recreational activity have been no, un understood. And I guess my question is, what's the threshold if you've got a, a TSA process that happens roughly every 15-ish years? Is that is that our, our planned on cadence? What, what is the threshold for anything happening outside of, of those processes? Or is it really that the, the, the concept is you get a bite at the apple every 15 years? And like, I'm just curious, where is the, how do you make some uh, uh, changes within that in, in, in between planning processes. It's called the squeaky wheel. <laughs> the adaptive management. I mean, I know we don't have meat, but I mean, I'm, just, I'm just curious. Like, how does it work? If we're running down a rabbit hole, tell me and I'll, we, we can take this offline. I'm just, I, I think it's important though to just for, to understand when, when is it okay to make a change outside of an official planning process and when is it not? Well, uh, we just went through a pretty robust e-bike discussion decisions. There's mm -hmm. existing plans that speak to that, and we uh, that that got opened up. Gotcha. So uh, I would say uh, there is nothing that beholds us for taking an element of an approved plan and revisiting it. Uh, right now, there is not a plan to uh, open up, let's say, a whole planning process like the North TSA. We're just beginning to implement the North TSA. But it's not off the table to okay. open up any aspect of a plan and to re, to revisit it. Um, so, uh, I think planning decisions certainly does inform and even could have very much relevance to today. And as you know, Brady, it's uh, I think you you've been involved in some planning processes. Often, planning decisions are all linked kind of together, and you pull one thread, and it it's potentially linked to another decision. And so from a staff perspective, we do look, you know, we use some level of caution when we do dis, uh, determine to open up just one element of a plan, knowing that decisions often were interrelated and linked. So, but, but no, the answer is it's because something might've been approved or denied in 2005 doesn't mean that we can't look at it. Okay, thank you for that, thanks. Okay, uh, Bo, I, I think you were mentioned here earlier as having worked with uh, the group abbreviations, but the, um, and in terms of their stewardship, can you tell me a little bit about the trails that they use? We talk a lot about it on OSBT about designated trails, undesignated trails. Are those on the chopping block or are they, if they are social trails, or, or, are there plans to designate them or, or 
or their plans to close them. I, I don't know that, um, I, and I am admittedly extremely map challenged. I'm also colorblind. So when you point out the colors in a map, I'm completely lost. And even looking at a map, it's, um, yeah, anyway, uh, I, I've been very challenged because Dave's my mentor when it comes to maps. So, it, um, you know, when they, where they access their launch pads, do you, are they designated trails? They are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And that, that's our focus has been the last three years and moving forward is to try to work on the existing designated trails that access the launches uh, behind the one on hill. Um, and, you know, trying to balance that idea of sustainability with direct access as it's a sport that you want to get from top to bottom or right. bottom to top as, as quick as possible to complete the flight. And so as we look towards implementing some of those plans in the West or the North TSA in that area, it's, it's finding that balance of how can we achieve that balance of sustainability and, and recreation? So do we know uh, kind of the non hang glide, hang glider, paraglider use of those trails, what that is? I asked, well, do you have an idea? That's I know, funny. other than anecdotal. <laughs> yeah, there, I think, uh, Dion Vanderwitty, our human dimension supervisor, had uh, data from 2012 was the most recent. And so I, and it didn't differentiate between a paraglider versus a hiker. And so unfortunately, I don't. Well, presumably, though, they get some ancillary use. Yep. Um, yeah. And so my, my concern is then when they get to the termination, which is the launch site, then what? Um, and so are those conduits to then off trail? use uh, th throughout the system or not. So anyway, um, I, I, I think it's worth, you know, paying some attention to, you know, kind of what is happening, um, you know, on those trails because, you know, they're, they're designated trails so people can be on them. But what happens once they get up to the launch site uh, and they're not hang gliding or paragliding? So the other question I had, and I know you know I'm gonna ask this, Lisa is on commercial use and why that isn't referenced in the MOU. Um, it's it's my feeling that there ought to be at least some reference to the relationship of commercial use to this agreement. And what you know, even if it's just you know commercial use is permitted under the commercial use permit. It, it strikes me that the city is responsible for enforcing commercial use. And so if, if it's not in this agreement under the city you know, responsibilities, then there certainly could be some question as to whether in fact the city has purview in this particular activity to deal with commercial use. And, and I just think that there ought to be some brief reference, you know, just one, you know, alphabet <laughs> um, saying, you know, how commercial use is, is handled um, and not belabor it, but at least reference it so there is not a question um, in the future. And I know the guidelines speak actually pretty thoroughly to commercial use, but they are just guidelines and that really doesn't hold a whole lot of uh, legal water um, if there is a question on, on that. And I know in the past, uh, commercial use at these sites has been an issue and I'm, I'm thinking a long time ago when you know things were just getting started and people were asserting that, you know, they could do whatever they wanted, wherever they wanted. Um, and so I think it's it's definitely worth, uh, you know, in a cautionary way, just referencing it in the MOU so that there's no question about what people need to do if they're gonna be commercial operators. Um, we will definitely take that note and follow up. When we were first looking at their the way that they're organized as an association and their fee structure, we have in the past had private entities um, apply for commercial use permitting to run programming and it was a fee for service and they were collecting money and generating right. revenue off of that. And so very clear cut commercial use with this where it was a association, a membership, none of the people who are actually flying are generating any revenue off the land. So we, we ended up in this gray area, um, but I think we can we can definitely reference that language within there and just make yeah, sure just it's circular. Yeah, explain whatever yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, you know, and one last thing, just as a interesting sidelight, uh, Kay Tauscher, 
who was instrumental in actually getting um, this this whole activity off the ground years ago uh, served on the Open Space Board, um, and she was um, you know a commercial pilot, or she was an instructor, um, and but it was very instrumental actually in the early um, you know agreements and uh, working together. So. There has been some representation on the board in, in years past for, directly from the, you know, the Iraqi Mountain Hang Glider. I, I was a member and learned how to fly on that very hill, mm. actually. So <laughs> that's great. Well, then we well. continue the tradition. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, any other comments or suggestions? If not, uh, now where was I? <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me. <laughs> As our biggest volunteer group. You want to take a towel? Why don't we take five minutes? Sure. Yeah, because it's been a lot of what them set up. We'll be back at 7.38. Bathrooms. <laughs> Thank you. Audio. Okay. Okay, you're right. You're, yeah, good to go. And I think you're. All right, I'm going to turn this next item over <laughs> yeah. to Janelle Freeston, our deputy director of <laughs> the, uh, CCMP. Yeah, <laughs> great. Thank you. So, um, yeah, so next week is National Volunteer Week. And so it's, it's pretty nice. This presentation usually coincides with that. And so it's a great opportunity for us to share gratitude for those in the community who have volunteered with us in 20. 22. So we'll be taking a little bit of a look back from last year, um, a little focus on next year and sharing also our master plan implementation. And I'll say to kick it off, um, we will focus more on volunteerism and we will also talk a little bit about our team, which is volunteerism, service learning and partnerships, some of the other services that we provide beyond um, volunteerism. And some of the themes that we saw last year, just in a nutshell, um, innovation, and then really focusing on system presence and continuing to support this amazing uh, community of volunteers that we have. So great, I will we'll go ahead to the next slide. So yeah, I'll be kicking it off and then I'll be also passing it over to Debbie Cushman and Bo Clark who are here tonight. Um, and in just a minute on the next slide, I'll show you who on staff are have primary roles focused on volunteerism and supporting our community then we will talk about how um, our efforts support the master plan and our impact that with the volunteers that we've been able to make on the land. Um, again, plans for 2023. And then a nice, uh, this is a tradition we have every year that we have the chair read the volunteer, National Volunteer Week Declaration. And then we'll wrap it up with any questions that you might have. Great, so next slide. So this is our team from 2022. Um, I won't go ahead and read all the names on the slides, but just know it's uh, a mighty team here that we get to focus on such a great portion. Uh, what a great job we get to have, right? To steward to steward these lands and really connect people with hands-on ways to give back to, to our department. Um, I will say a few things to the VSLP team. Um, our team consists of the two uh, pictures at the top um, it's a volunteerism team and then the junior ranger coordination team. And then this, the photos on the bottom, Bo Clark, who's here with us tonight, as well as Steve Barry. They're not in our technical work group, but they, and they serve the primary role of connecting people to the trails, um, through trails, volunteer opportunities. And then I just wanted to also point out, there's a citywide volunteer cooperative. So there are um, volunteer coordinators throughout the city that we connect with. We have a shared strategic plan. We have consistency um, amongst policies and procedures. And so that's a really important base of colleagues that we share this, this, um, this amazing role with and trying to get people to want to volunteer for all of Boulder, not just um, OSMP. Um, great, so we'll go to the next slide. And we can just bounce to the next slide. So we'll, jump, we'll just jump right in. Um, this slide, we'll just be on this for a second. This showcases both the X's and the stars because I didn't have time to make it unified. Um, again, our, our services, our work group, we are really hitting upon many master plan strategies. Um, and through that, we actually serve um, our partnership and we're supporting colleagues in all four service areas at OSMP. 
So it's really like we are, again, like that conduit to try to connect the need. So sometimes the need can come from the, the project managers, like, hey, we could use some volunteers out on a project. Other times the volunteers might come to us and say, hey, we'd really like to get involved. And so we really try to match that. We're matchmakers of trying to make this work happen. So then next slide. And I'm actually going to turn it over to Debbie now. So she's going to take a deeper dive and kick us off again into um, the volunteer. Good, we're back. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Debbie Cushman, uh, volunteer program manager. Okay, thanks, Janelle. Hi, all. Thanks for having me here tonight. Um, this slide is just our overall 2022 volunteer impact. Um, I will let you look through the numbers. It will, um, it's very inspiring to me to see so many hours, so many volunteers. Um, we'll be sharing for the rest of uh, the presentation examples of how the volunteers have engaged with the community and how they engage with the land. These numbers represent um, stewards being created and people willing to share their time and talent with open space and mountain parks, which we are so lucky to have. I'll give you a few seconds if you want to read the um, quote that's up there from one of our volunteers. Next slide, okay. This uh, graph shows some of our volunteer trends. As you can see, Open Space and Mountain Parks experienced a six-year increase in volunteers after the flood. And um, of course, then we had a little drop during COVID times and we are ramping back up. We are um, working on getting back up to our levels from 2019. We've, we've seen a little bit of drop, um, but Although we've seen a bit of bit drop in hours we, or people, we still have plenty of people doing many hours out on the land. We had a little bit of some staffing transitions in the last couple of years. And so now we're pretty well staffed back up and we will be getting those hours and programs back all online again. So we're looking forward to that. We're also looking at just ways to retain volunteers um, and support them while they're out in the field. We do an annual survey to check in with our volunteers, see what we're doing right, see what we need to improve on. Um, this question, our first one um, was uh, just asking how satisfied they were with their volunteering and out of a scale of one through five, the average was 4.75. So we were really happy about that. Um, we uh, also asked, we always ask our volunteers if they're sharing information with other people, recommending to others, and 100% of them this year gave us a thumbs up that they are recommending volunteering to their friends and families. And probably one of the biggest things we've seen in the last couple of years in our annual surveys is the number of ways um, volunteers want to be recognized. And even though they do like the gifts we do and other nice things, um, really small gatherings with staff is the number one thing they like. So we're really kind of restructuring how we do that. Um, things like uh, whoever my partner is on bike patrol in the ranger section and I leading small bike rides with some of the bike patrollers, finding fun things like fossils out on the system and talking about regulations from the ranger side. Um, Chad Brotherton led a couple hikes with the trail crew, this the trail ambassadors this year, the folks out on the trails giving information to folks and um, explain to him how we make trail decisions, which was great. So really finding cool ways to connect. And we're, we're gonna keep working on that. I'm gonna jump into one day volunteer projects now. Um, all right. Um, this is one day projects are not managed by me, they are expertly managed by um, Chris Weinberger on our staff in VSLP as well as Bo Clark in trails and Dave Barry on the trailhead staff. Uh, these are grand totals for all of their projects, but Bo is gonna break down the trail projects in a few minutes for us. And the one highlight I wanted to point out here were, were our teen um, and youth programs. So we're pretty excited to have 269 teens volunteer with us 
uh, doing some maintenance type work and some work enhancing the Sombrero Marsh area. Another example of innovation this year was recruiting um, certain or look, looking towards some of our one day volunteer projects and how they fit in with climate action. So you can see there's a seed collecting project as well as a chipping project going on in these pictures. Uh, we created an educational component. So we now invite um, one of our outreach and education staff members to come and they come to these one day projects and talk a little bit, um, help empower people to make differences in regard to climate change, tell them how their work here at Open Space is helping make those differences as well. So we're gonna continue to do that. And I'm gonna turn it over to Beth to talk about trail projects. Thank you, Deb. Yeah, so in the trails volunteer side of the world, we're, the, the program is growing. We're seeing more and more people wanting to get out, help us with our trails, um, build trails, maintain trails, learn about trails. So we're trying to take all of that and kind of combine it into an experience for everybody. In 2022, we've, we've seen some massive growth. Um, we had 840 volunteers, 4,562 hours, worth a little over $136,000. Um, you know, just some fun facts. We transported 84 tons of material to repair trails. We um, maintained 82 drainage structures. We restored almost 13,000 square feet of undesignated trail or highly impacted widened trail. So we're trying to do a but everything with volunteers and try to expand what um, we're able to do and what we're able to offer to give people that kind of stewardship experience. Um, one of the biggest new things in 2022 that's been highly successful was Trail Work Tuesdays. That's a nice little oration. Worked well with a hashtag to recruit volunteers via social media. In 2022, we did 11 Tuesday projects. So that's one every month, except for one that got, I think it was rained out or hailed out or something. Uh, between June and August, we had 68 volunteers, gave 388 hours. This really helped establish what I've been calling uh, frequent flyers, those who come back again and again. They feel like they're a part of the crew. They, they meet others who come back. And what I've learned is, you know, some of those individuals have volunteered for 20 years with, with VOC or WRV in town. And I'm like, oh, well, you know how to do this restoration. They're actually teaching me. So it's really cool to kind of share that knowledge. And they keep coming back. And this is kind of that growth model that we're looking for. Um, it was so successful, we're going to expand to Trail Work Tuesdays and Wednesdays. <laughs> so that's exciting. And yeah, we're, we're hitting those master plan goals, reducing our trail maintenance backlog, um, reducing the designated trails, and then something that's kind of often missed is supporting that passive rec, because you think about it, recreation is such a huge part of what we do. It's such a huge part of the trails that, you know, whether it's folks that the trails, the active part of their recreation, like a mountain biker or a trail runner or a horseback rider, or like climbers or paragliders, that trail gets you to where you need to go to complete your, your rec activity. So we use those, those uh, recreation groups to, to our advantage. Next slide. So where are we at, where we were at and where we're going? Um, it really started in 2013 after the flood. We rec recognized everybody needed to get out and volunteer to help us <laughs> rebuild our system, open our system back up after we had to close it and assess and figure things out. I would say we've had some slow growth prior to the pandemic. Those are what I kind of call the reactive years, kind of learning what this community wanted. Yeah, we always hosted National Trails Day. We always did these big Saturday events, but they weren't, you had sort of the trails program over here and then you had the volunteers over here and they were sort of interacting, but they weren't a cohesive unit. And I would say after COVID and in 2021 and 2020, 2022, we've been really proactive. Now, volunteerism is really a, steady part of how uh, Chad and myself really look at the work plan and start deciding how are the volunteers integrated into our trail projects and how do we build new projects that are supporting volunteers. Um, yeah, and then just the, the, the graph up there just kind of shows the about one third is like open to the community. Those are events like National Trails Day or Trail Work Tuesdays. Anybody can sign up um, to contribute. The other side of that is businesses and partners, so our partnership groups. Um, make up quite a bit of what we do. I'm trying to kind of get that graph back to a 50-50, open up more opportunities that you don't have to be a part of some other organized group. You can just come out and work with the crew. So that's the goal moving forward. Next slide. Talking about partnerships. Yeah, we're constructing and maintaining our trails. Partnerships allow us to define roles and responsibilities, lean on 
um, some of our partners to recruit and retain volunteers for us. It's, it's a huge part of what helps me just focus on developing great projects and keeping people safe is relying on our partners to, to recruit for us. So um, there's been a growing request from local businesses, particularly ones that pay their employees to come out and volunteer for the day. We've found that there's nobody greater at moving dirt and rocks than people <laughs> who are getting paid to not sit at their desk. <laughs> so totally use that to our advantage. Just want to recognize some of our special user groups, some of those rec groups, Boulder Mountain Bike Alliance, Flatlands Climbing Council, Volunteers for Outdoor Colorado, Boulder Climbing Community, and we talked a lot about Rocky Mountain and gliding and paragliding. Those are those groups that we're really building these relationships with and helping us to get our work done. In 2022, we had the Watershed School, a group of middle school age students came and spent a week with us. Various trail projects, they got some education outreach time. I thought by the end of the week, it was really cool to see the kids not only recognize how hard trail work is and how important it is, but they learned a lot and we learned a lot from them about, oh, right. They were seeing things that I just don't see. My brain is so like focused on dirt and rocks and they're like, well, yeah, but what if you went around this tree or you did it? And I'm like, oh, that's a unique way to look at things. So uh, in 2023, we're gonna focus our partnership on the North Sky Trail construction. We have an MOU with Boulder Mountain Bike Alliance and then we have a service contract with Volunteers for Outdoor Colorado. They're gonna be integral partners in addition to other community members to help us build that trail. Um, and just lastly, I just wanna point out, you know, getting towards this North, North Skyle model where volunteers and OSMP trails are, are combined into one, but it really started a couple of years ago on the Royal Archery Route with Boulder Climbing Community and Finance County Council who, you know, we paid some of their trail crews to come in and help us. But they also brought immense amount of volunteers and people that would come back and who knew that trail and wanted to help us get it to the place it is. And it turned out to be very successful and saved us a lot of money too. So that was a highlight. Thanks. Okay. I'm gonna jump back in and um, we've kind of heard a lot about our trail projects and our one day volunteer projects. And I am gonna move into talking about the programs, the projects that I manage, which are the long-term committed commitment volunteers. And um, this slide shows our three top hourly groups. Um, NOSBT is the little no, place. No, no, no. The shallow, it's like small. I was going to log in to do my count my in an hour. It took me like 15 minutes to figure out what email address yeah. I was doing. Well, you guys, y'all can all, we're here to help. Y'all can always call me and I can help you put your hours in because I do, I'm on CMIB 24 hours a day, it seems like. So um, just give me a shout. But, our big hour groups are wildlife monitors, really, are just two groups, our bat and raptor monitors give us the most hours on the land, which is really fantastic. Our trail ambassadors, or we've called them trail guides up to now, we've called them trail patrollers in the past, it's a very long time program. We're calling them trail ambassadors now, so, um, and, and then OSBT, so thank you all for all your hours. <laughs> I'm seeing them. <laughs> uh, next slide. They're not saying mine. Basically. Well, I'm not saying yours, <laughs> but we'll talk about that. I guess for you sometimes. Uh, well, yeah. I just talked to Janelle. I'm in now. <laughs> just um, so our volunteer ambassadors um, uh, are out on the land at popular trailheads, usually at Chautauqua or in the Ranger Cottage. They're up at Flagstaff Nature Center. Um, our trail and bike ambassadors are out recreating alongside all of our visitors. Ambassadors all wear uniforms, they turn in reports that um, provide OSMP staff with very timely information on things like trail damage, fence repairs, down trees, damage signs, um, as well as some ge general usage and conflict issues. So I'm really moving away from using these words, reduced user conflict, and I put in uh, quotes up there, promoting visitor harmony. So that's my new tagline. That's my 2023 tagline for volunteers. We are promoting visitor harmony. Um, those are the number of contacts each of those groups make. They're pretty substantial, incredible amount of contacts we are making. I know Bike Patrol, our interagency Bike Patrol looks small, but we're not asking our mountain bikers to jump off bikes and make constant contacts, but they are there modeling really good behavior and um, helping out with trail work trail repair, bike repairs, and things like that on the system. Um, a couple other things I just wanted to point, point out that some some new things we did this year that, well, last year we put some shade structures up for our volunteers up at the Chautauqua Trailheads. That's the top picture. And um, 
we're really finding we make a lot more contacts when we're out on the trail at the trailhead versus in the ranger cottage to code for that one to happen. Because I worked in the ranger cottage until then, <laughs> before COVID and went, wow, look at all these people we're talking to standing out right here at the trailhead. So that was exciting. Um, we are also, the bottom picture is bike patrol. We did a little partnership this year with um, the um, Horsemen's Association, the Boulder County Horsemen's Association. They came to me with some concerns about horse bike conflict on our trails. And we said, okay, well, let's pull in our interagency bike patrol and we'll figure out some ways to do it. So we're trying to do some more trailhead outreach to bikers and they're stopping. We're giving them swag on the weekends out places. This was out at um, Boulder Valley Ranch. Um, this fall. So we're going to keep doing those. We're, our trail ambassadors are going to be up on Shanahan starting on May 1st when the cows go out to eat all the grass. Uh, explain a little more to the community why we have cows out and what they're doing on the system. But we found um, our folks putting the cows out, our resource stewardship team would love to have more help out there. And we thought, perfect, perfect job for trail ambassadors. Um, and just so you um, just wanted to point out, one thing we just started in the last um, year or so with this team especially, but we're going to try to do with all our teams is at all trainings from now on and all team meetings, there's 15 to 20 minutes of um, Jedi work. So justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion work going on. And I'm pulling you know, small bits from lots of places and we'll look at formalizing that a little bit more in the future. Another one of our ongoing um, programs is trail and trailhead maintenance. Um, we have folks who are out there doing some very thankless work of picking up dog poop on the system. And um, in the last few years, starting in 2019, working with Lisa Gonzalo, we started the Let's Do It campaign, which came out of Jeffco originally. And we now do it with Jeffco, Boulder County, and City Parks and Recs folks. And we're just trying to kind of have a standard message along the whole front range for all our trail users. Pick up your poop, <laughs> take it with you, put it in a trash can. And um, this is a group who is participating with us uh, this year. Kind of the model that we've used here on open space, all, all the agencies are kind of doing a little bit, you know, a little bit different methods. But what we've done here is we have these orange flags and, um, there's a picture of one in the sign up there. We're going out usually on a Thursday or a Friday at different trailheads, and we are flagging piles of poop that are left on the trail. We're flagging bags that are left on the trail, and um, we put a sign, a signboard like this one up that explains to the public what the flags are. So for the next couple of days, when they see the flags, they can read about it, and we're also inviting them back on the weekend to come help us pick the poop up. So. We have had some pretty good success with this program. We're gonna scale it back a little bit this year. We got, we did about five trailheads last year. It was very staff intensive, very volunteer intensive. And it was great. I think we're gonna just try to do a small one this year out at Dry Creek, which is pretty much our biggest problem area for dog poop. So May 7th, if anyone wants to join us, pick it up too. These are some of our resource restoration steward groups uh, on open space. Our Boulder Creek Path Foothills Hospital Site Group is a small but mighty team. They are doing work with eradicating thistle, teasel, motherwort, sweet pea and garlic mustard and dames racket. Um, the Skunk Canyon team is in its third year. This was a neighborhood partnership that was interesting, interested in eradicating weeds right in their own area. They do a lot of myrtle spurge, teasel, and musk thistle. And new this year, we are going to pilot working um, eradicating poison hemlock with them after a long SOP process of how that will work. But they will be on the land with staff working on that. We have a few individual folks out doing myrtle spurge work in Chautauqua. That's um, becoming quite a problem out there. So we're psyched to have them. And then we have native gardeners who work at the Ann Armstrong Garden at the Ranger Cottage as well. So our 
wildlife monitors, our, our bat and raptor monitors, like I said earlier, some of our highest hours of folks out on the system. Uh, they're providing incredible data for our ecologists, incredible observations. Um, they're helping us make management decisions in regards to wildlife. They are troopers. They are often out very early in the morning. And as we know, our bat monitors are out in the evening. And um, a really joyful part of my job, I actually was a bat monitor a long time ago. <laughs> and um, it, every night is fun because you're hiking out in the dark. <laughs> so th there's something fun every night to see. Um, and lots of wildlife <clears throat> out at night. And I have heard from monitors the next day about um, mountain lion sightings, and the best ever was a uh, last year when I got a call, kind of kind of late at night, and picked up the phone, and it was a couple of bat monitors out, and they're telling me a bear about a bear encounter, and um, that was great. <laughs> I was happy they called me because I thought they were back at their cars, and after about a thirty seconds, I'm like, "So you're looking at the bear right now? Is that is that it?" And we walked through that together. All was safe and sound. I think I was more panicked than they were. <laughs> Our um, education volunteers uh, provided almost a thousand hours of programming this year. They do much of that programming on the land, coming up with creative, wonderful programs teaching about the flora, the fauna, about coexistence, biodiversity. And um, they also do a winter wildlife program, which the volunteers really started as a way to keep busy during the winter months and is super successful. We are in all the Boulder Valley School Districts and we are focusing on um, wildlife issues like bears, lions, snakes, and coyotes. And uh, teaching, teaching the kids, we're hoping they're taking those lessons home with them. So. And lastly, our wellness, well, not lastly, second to lastly, <laughs> our wellness um, volunteers. Uh, these um, are volunteers that support um, wellness and recreation out on the system. The top picture there is um, a yoga class up at Flagstaff Amphitheater. We have one very dedicated volunteer. This will be her third season teaching yoga come Join us some mornings. I think she starts usually around 8.30 on Saturdays. I'll, I'll have the date soon for those from Maddie. No, oh, she just had a baby, but she tells me she will be back to teach. So we're excited about that. Um, and then we have recreation volunteers. And that bottom picture is two brand new volunteers. I actually, we just trained them. Um, it's actually a father and his daughter who's standing behind him like that. And they're helping Topher Downham with his hand cycle bike rides. And if you all have never been on one and would like to go, please reach out to me. I am, it's a really fun experience. And they now have motor assists on those bikes because they didn't the first years we did them. And um, it's all, you know, you're, you're moving. But um, yeah, happy to take anyone out who would like, like to experience that. Uh, we also had, um, one other new partnership this year, and I think you've already heard about it maybe at a prior board meeting at the Boulder Community Health Pathways Program. And we've had three really dedicated education volunteers who have jumped in to work with that group. So they're really fostering some deep connections between the natural and human community in Boulder through movement, reflection, and lessons that nature provides. And they've really, uh, they really put their hearts and souls into that work. It can be um, very challenging, they have told me, and very rewarding. And last is our open space <laughs> trustees. <laughs> Not forget you did. We need a group photo of you. I need a photo of you all. <laughs> um, so when I average your hours, you're each doing about 300 hours a year, which is a lot of work. So thank you. I have a picture hey guys. of the whole master plan book because you're pretty much helping us with all of those goals. So thanks again. And I'm going to turn it back to you. Yes, yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, um, we just want to take a few minutes just to 
remind that our, our team also, beyond volunteerism, we do service learning as well, which we see that as, well, the first example I'll share is ready to work. This is where we are either um, working with a contract or we're paying youth through the Junior Ranger program to do, again, hands-on work with our, with our department. And this is a program Chris Weinberger runs, ready to work over a decade. We've had this contract in partnership with them. Incredible, incredible team. Um, really, through this program, the whole goal is skill development so that ready to work members can learn skills to be able to then go and get land based jobs or, or, or a pathway to another career. And um, they've worked, let's see how many hours, they had 50 project days with us last year on a variety of things. They helped with the Marshall um, fire recovery efforts. They clean miles and miles and miles of ditch, ditches for us. They do invasive species removal. And one thing I wanna give Chris Weinberger um, a kudos here is that, right, they're doing this work for us. And we also wanna really be mindful of their, their whole holistic wellness. Um, these are people that have experienced really tough times in their life. And so she has piloted working um, with Lauren Kolb to be able to get them out onto some of our agricultural sites to do work. And then also kind of like therapeutic, right? Like some therapeutic experiences to get to work with the livestock and, and get their hands literally like in the dirt, doing some plantings and things like that. So such an incredible, incredible experience. And then um, a success story, right? A, a former ready to work crew member was hired by OSMP and is now on the FEMP crew. So we love hearing those kind of stories. And there's been so many other success stories with this program. And so, yeah, just huge shout out to that and every work group that supports this, the ready to work program. Okay, next slide. And then junior ranger program, um, Natasha Steinman leads us the junior rangers for our department. And she was just here in back in the fall. So I won't take too much time. I just want to say, um, super excited. Again, her goal for that program over the last couple of years is to really be mindful and increase the diversity of the program by very targeted and strategic ways to look at what are the barriers to applying. Um, do folks feel, everyone in the community, that they have the, um, an equal chance to be able to apply? And so she's one of the things I want to highlight is um, they had a partnership with the YSI program with Parks and Rec to start to work with middle school students so that they can start to get exposure to the junior ranger program so that then they can feel even more prepared to apply when they're high school students. So again, shout out to Natasha and the junior ranger program and please take a look at the program report that's on the website now. Next slide. And wrapping it up with, um, I, I was just here, I think last month or two months ago, um, our partnership impact, again, this program, we talked about so many partners we have in the community. We cannot do it without them. Um, I will take a few minutes, not minutes, but seconds to say, again, we are grateful for the Boulder Open Space Conservancy. This is a, uh, we do have an MOU with them. They are our official 501c3, our fundraising partner. And so last year, um, they raised 41,945 towards the Mount Sanitas project, which Part of that, they were able to bring um, a helicopter to do some work there. Um, and then they also brought in other money for the Junior Ranger Program, for volunteer services, and the education and outreach team. And so, again, we are just really grateful for our partnership with BOSC. And then, next slide. All right. We'll go into plans. We talked a little bit about this already, but again, our goal continued to develop um, relationships with our volunteers, really focus on retention try to bring up more participation levels similar to what Bo is seeing on the trails end of things. Um, continuing those climate action volunteer projects. We have had folks that reached out to Chris Weinberger saying like, thank you so much. I mean, folks want to volunteer, right? But it's, it's climate action is on really top of mind for so many people and to maybe have them feel like they're contributing towards that. We've gotten a lot of great feedback on that. As Bo mentioned, expanding trail work Tuesdays to Wednesdays, exploring more equity and diversity initiatives. And I won't read all of these, some of these I had already mentioned, but we're really excited for what the rest of this year brings. Next slide. And then now I will turn it over again. This is this part of the, the annual um, tradition where we'll have Dave say the declaration for National Volunteer Week. Before I do that, I wanna thank all of you. Um, this is always such a really reassuring and uplifting uh, moment for the board and the department. I mean, the volunteer program uh, is, is really uh, pretty special. And we thank you all for, uh, for participating and working hard to make it so successful. 
So I'm honored to read this. Um, I have to take my glasses off. I can't see anymore. <laughs> so um, the Open Space Board of Trustees joins the staff of the City of Boulder Open Space and Mountain Parks Department in recognizing all our volunteers during National Volunteer Week 2023. We salute the hundreds of open space and mountain parks volunteers who contributed their talents and efforts in helping the department carry out its city charter purposes for open space. This community of volunteers is an inspiration as their contributions help to protect the resources and provide for enjoyable experiences, making Boulder's open space and mountain parks a special place. Thank you. Patty. Thank you again. Thank you. And then last slide. Right before we dive into questions, I do also want to thank again, this is not just this core team. Again, this is in our job descriptions officially to engage with volunteers. I want to thank the over 40 staff members at OSMP who also, again, as you were saying, this is like an interwoven really, you know, foundation that our department works closely with volunteers. It's been a thread that's been woven through our department for so many years. And so just huge shout out to all the um, such subject matter ex experts, all the liaisons, all the, the leads that work directly with the volunteers as well. They just aren't here presenting with us tonight. So thank you. So with that, we have these questions for you and you don't, you know, feel free to ask whatever, but we're just curious, you know, are you hearing, if you are hearing from individuals about ways they want to get involved that you feel like we're not um, providing those opportunities now, please let us know. Um, about other ways we could help them get involved. And then otherwise, if you have any other questions about the SLP. Seems like you're reaching a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And one of the goals is more individuals as opposed to pre-organized groups, uh, which has got to be challenging. It's handsier because you're getting one by ones as opposed to big chunks of people. Yeah, a lot of I mean, it seems, I mean, this is an overwhelming success story, it seems to me. Thank you. So I was going to ask in that regard, um, it is what is the most effective way of reaching, you know, community members? Um, is the website uh, good at that, or what do you, what do you think is most effective as far as getting information out into the community, you know, for volunteer opportunities? I'll pass it to both. Yeah, you share on that. Social media has been helpful for those individuals that are maybe looking to find more, but we ride in the trail world, I rely on the partners, you know, Boulder Mountain Bike Alliance is much better at recruiting <laughs> bikers to come out and do trail work than I am. <laughs> so I go, great, you recruit, I'll develop the plan, keep you safe out there and we'll get some work done. So, but yes, social media has been one of those ways we're trying to explore um, and, you know, trying to get people to talk up our program and tell their friends, you know, that's, that's yeah. sort of part of it. referral yeah. process yeah. or meeting them out on the trails. Right. Right. It's more common than you think I'll see a trail runner that's like, hey, do you need help? I got like five <laughs> friends. We do this every Saturday. And I'm like, I don't know, let's find something. So, so do companies reach out to you? Uh, do you ever reach out to companies? Or mostly them contacting staff for opportunities for mostly them contacting stuff and get again unless we already have a relationship with them prior year and we want to call them back and say hey are you interested in coming back that kind of thing but yeah we so we have a form on the website that people can organizations can request a project an organized project um and i wanted to say as well shout out to the education and outreach staff at the ranger cottage our volunteers again you know when they're interacting with volunteers and trying to get that sense of what's what are you excited about about the system and they if they get an inkling of oh i'm excited about birds you know hey we have this raptor program and so a lot of that can happen through those thousands of contacts that you've seen on the slides how many of your volunteers are court mandated mm -hmm. dave would dave would yeah, know dave, you, it's a it's couple hundred a year through something on one of our slides mm -hmm. um yeah we can get back to you. It's, I mean, it does. Yeah, a couple hundred a year. Yeah. It's a chunk. Yeah. Okay. We had one or two trail work last year that we're doing that some, some their community yeah. service, a couple of college students. Is that a growth area for you? Or? <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Yeah. Why are you asking? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Next year before. A certain organization that I know uh, used to get a lot because they were deep struggling with A. Mm -hmm. And when people were looking at the list, they're just like, oh, gosh. Pick the top one mm -hmm. and get over with. Anyway, um, it's funny, but it says last year twenty. Um, 
we're so grateful for Dave Barry because yeah, he he has a relationship with the court system, so they know like he's on their list, like they know to refer to Dave. Yeah. And sometimes we can't take them because if they don't give us enough notice or you know, so what we haven't been tracking as much is how many people were turning away just because of you know schedules don't work, the days don't work, or staff capacity on that given day. But yeah, there's definitely for all of these programs, there's an interest, and we have to turn folks away sometimes because we can't always provide the opportunity. And that's where the volunteer cooperative through the whole city is great. Mm -hmm. Like just the other day, someone like so excited about the Raptor program, but we're not recruiting any Raptor volunteers. And we've already started like in January, we're out starting our Raptor counts and things. But I just happened to go, hey, hold on a second. And then I popped a, a quick note to Joy Masters over at Parks and Rec. She goes, I need one more volunteer. I'm like, I got your person, hold on. And like within 10 minutes, he's like, what? And I'm like, I think, I'm, I think Parks and Rec's got you, you know? And so it, it's a great system too, where we, if we're going to turn people away before we do so, I'm like, hey, check out this, check out that. So what I heard is that um, that repeat volunteers is good. Is that and particularly in your area, Bo, where it's a little, the work is a little more technical with trails. And so cause you're going to spend some time training them mm -hmm. that you, you're wanting these repeat volunteers. Or is there a better source for repeat volunteers? Is it I don't think it would be the one-offs, but these organizations like I think you said that, that you listed BMA and such. Mm -hmm. So is that your biggest source of just volunteers in general in your rec, in the rec groups and and also in the repeat volunteers? Yeah, definitely. Those are the the frequent flyers that are coming back. Are they're members of BMA and they've been riding here for 20 years or whatever, or climbers that have been involved. Um, so I, I would say that is the the big one and. You know, the future is, is, is wide open. What you want to, what a lot of other agencies nationwide are doing is trying to get programs developed where you're, you have volunteer crew leads, right? Um, we're trying to work towards that where you have trained volunteers that are, have been sort of trained and signed off to be able to kind of lead others. So that kind of train the trainer program. So we're looking into that and seeing how we can develop something like that too. And I get that we could do a better job. My my neighbor who is a veterinarian asked how he could get involved in and um, building trails. I just I sent him to BMA mm -hmm. or to working on trails because I didn't know actually how to find the source in the city website. So I sent him to be to BNA, BMA because I knew they were doing the trail Tuesdays. And so I think you can always send them to me, but I think <laughs> BMA's how I will. Yeah. <laughs> um, the question for you, Debbie, when with the poop volunteers, which just sounds so great. <laughs> um, <laughs> Of my own dog and I'll, <laughs> I'll pick up other yeah, yeah. stuff but um you're, you mentioned that you're flagging and um you know I think in like Louisville they have these these flags in the trails that there are no poop fairies mm -hmm. yeah and I, I don't know you know, I, it's great that you're flagging them and mm -hmm. grabbing people's attention but right it's not just a pile of poop but it's something catchy that um gets yeah it gets their attention that there's Course, then you are actually saying there are poop fairies. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like, that's you are, you are, there are. Yes, Michelle, fairies, I, I agree but... with you. Yes. It's, it's a little bit of, um, I've always had a little bit of controversy because I don't believe that we should be picking up everyone's poop. I believe the users and the dog, you know, guardians should be picking up their poop. Um, so we are looking at it as a way to make it, it's an awareness campaign is what we want it to be, not a we're gonna pick your poop up campaign, more of an awareness. So the flags are to point that out. Um, I, I'm working right now, I don't think I've been talking about it yet with Janelle and Jan and then Lisa Gonzalo um, on another dog poop initiative that will be coming down the pike in another few months maybe with a pilot program that we will bring to you um, to, to talk more about how we continue that thread of not being the poop fairy, but making more, more awareness, more people, maybe more ambassadors, someone out on the ground who can um, remind people. How many four what? Poop ambassadors? <laughs> poop ambassadors. Um, much, yeah. um, how many of those how much of the poop was actually in a bag that you're flagging versus yeah. sitting there? Yeah, almost, um, I'd say 80% is sitting in a pile when we're flagging, I'd say. With no maybe bag? With no bag. And oh. another 20% bagged it on the trail. Is there a way to plug into the user the user groups and kind of like you're you're doing that with the with the um, dog people? 
um, Fido's, mm -hmm. PC Pantry, the, the businesses in town that maybe could funnel some more volunteers for a, a coordinated effort, not to pick up a boot, yeah. maybe just. It's a great idea. I love that. We we are reaching out to fight. You know, we are regularly reaching out to Fido's, but um, and in the past we've reached out to a couple of like the adoption agencies around town. Um, Humane Society, we've been and invited them to come out to some some of our like at the trailhead at Sanitas on a poop event, like a do it event. But we've said, come on out, we can put a table up and talk about what we do in the dog community. So yeah, but that's great. I think we I think it's a good reminder to reach out to more of those folks. Well, I hope for those individual um, vol volunteers, you're giving them a whole lot of swag. <laughs> <laughs> Agree. Yes. Thanks for the Yes. Okay, if we're going to still stay on schedule, we this is, <coughs> lead up to, yeah, this is all lead up to the 2023 work plan and budget conversation. So, <laughs> yeah, thanks, you guys. Uh, really, it's great, and uh, thanks a lot. What Grace said, were you speaking of waste? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the budget is yeah. what? <laughs> all right, um, so this is going to be our first of four touches this year on the budget. This is a more of a high level discussion tonight. And uh, with that, we're going to turn things over to Sam McQueen, our senior manager of business services. Thanks, Dan. Uh, good evening, trustees, and welcome, Brady. Uh, I'm Sam McQueen, as Dan mentioned. I'm the uh, Business Services Senior Manager for the department. I'm joined by Cole Moffitt, our Senior Accountant for the department. Um, we're going to be talking to you today about our draft 2024 work plan and budget update. Next slide, please. So we'll start tonight with the goal of the April business meeting. Then we'll look at the timeline of budget presentations to the OSBT before moving on to the 2024 budget and work plan development processes. And then we'll have some time at the end for questions and discussion. Next slide, please. Our goal tonight is to ensure the OSBT has an understanding of the city's budget development process ahead of upcoming business meetings. Next slide, please. So this is our first meeting together to discuss the 2024 work plan and budget. We'll be coming to you to discuss budget at the next three business meetings, excuse me. So May through July. And then important city council and planning board meetings are also listed here for your review. Next slide, please. In previous years, the OSBT made recommendations on next year's budget for the Capital Improvement Program or CIP and operating budgets separately. After feedback from the OSBT and review with OSMP staff, we'll combine presentation, discussion, and recommendation of the CIP and operating budget as we plan for 2024. This chart shows the high level topics to be covered at each meeting. In July, we'll have a public hearing and seek the OSBT's recommendation on the 2024 CIP and operating budget together. Next slide, please. So beginning with a high level overview of our budgeting process, OSMP are the fund managers of the open space fund, but we also receive some appropriation from the lottery fund for certain CIP projects. The lottery fund is managed centrally for the city by the finance department. In the last couple of years, we've accomplished several projects with lottery money, including construction of a pedestrian bridge at the crossing of Four Mile Creek and rehabilitation of the Lewis House. In some cases, the lottery fund will pay for all expenses tied to a project. In others, projects may receive dollars from both the Open Space Fund and Lottery Fund. In 2023, we received $428,000 from the lottery fund to pay for a portion of the cost to construct the North Sky Trail. The OSBT is asked to recommend appropriations for both funds each year. And then moving on to the open space fund, it's a special revenue fund to be used specifically for open space purposes. As the fund managers, we ensure that we hold, uphold best practices in fund stewardship. And we also prepare and share a detailed fund financial with the OSBT and the public each year, which consists of the fund's revenues, expenditures, and reserves. Next slide, please. This chart shows where our funds fall within the city's governmental funds. Overall, governmental funds are used to account for all or most of a government's general activities, including the collection and disbursement of earmarked money, the acquisition or construction of general fixed assets, and the servicing of long-term debt. The open space fund accounts for all of these activities, and the other funds may be more specific to certain activities. You'll see the general fund listed here, which is used to account for all activities of the general government that are not accounted for in any of these other funds. The open space fund no longer relies on transfers from the general fund as you may have seen in previous years. Next slide, please. 
Turning to revenues, OSMP receives our revenue forecast from the finance department on a six-year rolling schedule. Refinements to the schedule are made annually based on updated projections. We're currently expecting to receive 2024 revenue projections in May, in time for the June business meeting. And 93% of draft revenues collected in 2022 come from sales and use taxes. The open space fund is comprised of different sales tax increments that were adopted through ballot measures over the city's longstanding conservation efforts. From this schedule, OSMP currently receives a 0.77 tax increment on sales tax within the city of Boulder. Next slide, please. So to explain how this shows up in the retail sales tax category, which is the largest revenue source for the open space fund, for every retail tax dollar collected in Boulder, 42 cents is retained by the city of Boulder, and of that 42 cents, nine cents goes to the open space fund. Next slide, please. One of the master plan strategies to promote financial sustainability centers on diversifying our revenue sources since we rely so heavily on sales and use taxes. To that point, staff have been asking, uh, have been seeking new grants and looking for more opportunities to collect revenues in the department. We also expect to receive funding from the recently passed climate tax. OSMP is grateful to the community and their support of the climate tax, which passed in November 2022. Collections began in January 2023. As a partner to other departments in this work, OSMP expects to receive $635,000 from the climate tax fund in the 2023 budget to support enhanced wildfire resilience actions. From here, I'll turn it over to Cole to discuss additional budget work and work planning information. Thanks, Sam, and good evening, trustees. Uh, Cole Moffett, Senior Budget uh, Accountant. Um, so OSMP's budget is comprised of two main components, um, as you might have seen, CIP and operating. The CIP contains discrete projects, typically over $50,000, and focuses on enhancement and maintenance of public infrastructure. Um, the city definition of capital expenditures focuses on like facilities and streets, but the open space fund um, has a bit wider purview as we adopt into like land management practices and acquisition efforts. Um, but also we have the operating budget, which focuses on day-to-day -day core services in the department, such as like personnel expenditures and ongoing programs that will continue um, year after year. And to put this into context, open space staff would propose um, construction of a new trail as a CIP project, but then the ongoing costs would be proposed under the operating budget to maintain that trail. Um, and Sam and I will discuss both components of the budget and deeper dives uh, over the next few meetings as we plan that out. Next slide, please. So moving along, we also have reserves and adjustments to consider. Um, so open space maintains 20% reserves in our fund financial to be adequately prepared for economic cycles and natural disasters. Our reserves are calculated at 20% of all operating costs plus debt. And focusing on adjustments, uh, departments have an opportunity to request additional funds for emergent and unplanned expenses that were not captured during the typical budget process. This happens each year in May and November, and the capital carryover from previous years runs concurrent with the first ATB in May. So this is an example, uh, a few examples of the ATB that we submitted in um, November of last year. And from this chart, you can see that these items all come from different sources like grants, donations, or a fund balance appropriation, which means there is no corresponding revenue intake. So that money comes straight from the open space fund bank account. And as Sam showed on an earlier slide, OSP on any given year is about 93% uh, revenues from sales tax. So it's very important that we continue to seek out other funding sources like grants to diversify our revenue. Next slide. So focusing on some work planning, uh, Open Space has developed a robust work planning process that is refined annually. It involves our staff building out project descriptions, estimated costs, schedules, and is reviewed and vetted through our leadership team to ensure balance across functions and master plan alignment. Projects are also reviewed by council and community prioritization, capacity, cost estimates, design, as well as a status as a new or continued project. The high priority projects are funded and projects that are determined to be less of a priority or are not ready are deferred to future years. So an example of this might be a project that requires some additional design work and is not yet ready for implementation might be deferred. 
on this slide. And so once open space finalizes our draft budget, we submit to the central budget team in the finance department for citywide review. The city has made several efficiencies to the budget development process, and we will inform the board of any updates as we meet over the next few months. And so from what you've heard this evening, there are a few key aspects of the budget we'd like to highlight for future meetings. The department will look to program increased revenue projections into the CIP and operating budget. We'll also partner with the finance department to program additional revenue from the climate tax. We heard feedback from the board last year around assigning staffing needs to programs and projects, and we'll continue to assess staffing needs with additional expected revenues. Staff are also closely reviewing the definition of CIP to determine if there would be any items in the CIP that would better be managed as the operating budget and vice versa. And finally, we'll continue to connect the budget components to the master plan through our process. And so with that, are there any questions that the OSBT has to ensure that we're bringing the most useful content forward in future meetings? Thanks, guys. Uh, any questions or comments? You said the 20% operating reserves are calculated from annual operating budget plus debt. Is that annual debt service or total debt? I think that's annual debt service per year. Yeah, so it's 20% each year of the six year horizon. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we and have one, we issued a bond in 2014 that we're paying, and then we have two outstanding bump of notes, which is a 10 year payment process to acquire property. So, um, debt service like over the last five years is probably down what 80% or something yeah, like right. that uh, as we've paid off other bump of notes in our 06 and 07 bonds but we're we're in each year holding 20% of what is in that year uh -huh. yeah that's just cash just sits in cash yeah, yeah. And, and most frequently what we're seeing for that use of reserves is around fire and flood right so we're we're able to through adjustment to base appropriate for example 1.6 million in damage from Marshall fire so we're pulling from that contingency in order to front the cost of repairs. Yeah, and Brady, just uh, from a citywide perspective, that each department, there's recommendations for each department to develop their own what appropriate level of, of reserves the city's general funds is trying to get to the 20% level. I think they're almost there. 16, 17. Yeah. 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 I think they're up in the high teens now with a goal of that. So there's a citywide effort to make sure each department is weighing where they where it's appropriate for them for reserves because we're so uh dependent on on the flood economic fluctuations yeah. and fire and yeah. flood uh we're landing at that 20 percent. i think the general fund's trying to get to the 20 percent too from a statewide perspective oh, interesting what uh, other question what are the what what are the implications of changing or, or honing in on the definition of cip versus operating is it is it advantageous is it easier to get cip dollars and so you're kind of like it's oh we can put more in that bucket it's better for us like what yeah, I can start by answering it if other folks want to jump in. Um, so I think there's, uh, we define the operating budget as these ongoing core services. So we're trying to take a look at what we have been funding in the CIP year over year and what is part of our ongoing core service. And so we'll be coming to you with some, some thoughts on what we think those ongoing core services are. Um, CIP is really those discrete projects. So they're the really, you know, the high dollar amount, $50,000 or more. Um, short-term projects and so we're taking a look at you know where are we focusing our efforts for those those six-year short-term projects versus what are we going to fund year over year and we will just consider that part of our base budget every year where we'll we'll just have that as our standard year over year to cover costs and just a, a couple of examples that come to mind so every year as long as i've been here eight years or so we've had a cip project for agricultural fencing where we're funding between 5,000 and 7,000 linear feet of fence replacement every year. So that's something where we, we know we're gonna be out repairing fence every year. And so is now an opportunity where we have a, we know our sales tax got extended. We have recovered from our COVID revenue cuts. We're seeing increased revenue. Is this an opportunity to just let's, oh, yeah, operating. exactly. We know that staff is gonna be managing fence replacement. Same with um, ditch maintenance and culvert maintenance out on some of these irrigated uh, fields. Um, and even even things, and we're not positive on this one yet. This is one that we're kind of on the fence about um, invasive tree removals out of the ecological restoration group. We've been funding that CIP every year. 
realistically, Megan knows she's going to be doing tree removals every year. So does it does it make sense to keep requesting that as new funding every year in the CIP rather than it's part of our base budget? She knows what she has every year and she can go and execute on those contracts. So to Cole's point earlier, these, these city definitions were designed for infrastructure. <laughs> it's like moving dirt, heavy equipment. And so we, we're not always a clean fit into to some of these capital definitions. So... And I would just say from a citywide perspective, again, each uh, city finance is asking each city department to have more consistency in what we define as a CIP project. So we were already well underway. And this year, there's sort of an ask of, uh, can you align yourselves with this definition? Council's been asking about it in particular about, you know, what is a capital project? And so from a citywide perspective, we're trying to get all departments to be speaking the same lingo and to kind of applying the criteria and the definition of a CI project consistently. So luckily we already were doing that, but it sort of en enhances the reason why we wanna take a closer look. So you'll see some shifts this year from things that we you might've seen show, sh showing up uh, in a CIP, it's now gonna be showing up and operating. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's some nuances between uh, capital uh, projects you can carry over the money year to year, mm -hmm. uh, and when it's not spent. So there's some the operating goes away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. And, then and, on the and I think side. from the board's from previous board's perspectives that they were always these conversations were always discreet exactly. conversations, and it it struck some of us that it started to make more sense to kind of you know start combining them uh, so that. You know, we could understand better, you know, kind of project wise what, what was really, uh, you know, the cost, or, you know, the funding and stuff. So this, I think, is really a good step uh, in that regard. Yeah, I'll just say that I really like that we're doing the capital and, and the operating budgets together. So thank you for doing that. And that's that was not easy, especially to get all of your assumptions in. Um, to, to, to get those dates to line up. Um, I'm wondering, like, how often have you had to uh, go to those May and November ATB conversation, uh, adjustment to base conversations? And why do you have to go in and ask for to spend money that be, when you've got an associated revenue when it's strictly a pass through? So I saw in your example, Cole, that you put like $34,000 for a grant, but then you actually have to ask ask to spend it sure yeah so it just seems i know it's like a lot of busy work it does yeah i can start um it's the way it happens like in that case with boss where we got the donation from mass anita so if we receive a check i think it was thirty four thousand dollars at the department level we can add it to our revenue but we can't add it to our expense we add it to our expense, it shows up as a negative actual. So it's just kind of peculiar. So like the way we have to do it is we have to add it to the budget side, but just the way the city is structured, the only way at the department level we can add to the budget is through the normal budget cycle or through the adjustment to base. And so sometimes we don't necessarily need to program that 34,000, but we still want to like signal to the council or to the public that like, hey, we've received this donation from this group or it could be strategic in that way. But um, I think it's just a little bit of a mixed bag of both of those things where like if we could put that on our budget ourselves, we would and not have to go through this process, but this is kind of what it is. So in the case of BOSS, when you get this money and you said you mentioned that you don't have to program it, mm -hmm. um, can you carry it over? Or um, do you have to budget it on the expense side so you can carry it over? Yes and no. And like, that's where it gets nuanced if it goes to a capital project or the operating. So it will carry over on the capital side on the books, but it'll carry over indefinitely regardless, because if we don't program it, it'll just go to the fund balance in the bank, which will then just be there until it gets appropriated to something else. If you put it in the expense line and you don't spend it, you're going to show that year as a surplus. If it's a yeah. capital project. If it's a capital project, yes. Capital and, project. and it'll carry over. If it's operating, it'll just zero out and go to the bank. And, yeah. <laughs> and there's so many very nuanced examples. I mean, we had we yeah. a quest from a, a gentleman who passed away a couple of years ago who 
dedicated a certain amount with with attachments, right? I want this to be spent on flora and fauna. So in the first year we spent, you know, 35,000 and then we carry over the balance into the into the next year, right? But we want to be able to part of the yeah. benefit I think from finances perspective is the is the tracking when you have to do like federal and state grant reporting or report out to somebody where you can show each year that it was carried, how much of it was spent, what was it spent on, but it is a challenging process and and I think what we're trying to do you'll 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 actually be seeing more we, we've started showing you our atb requests like they're they're in the council packet you have access to them but we wanted we wanted to start including that in what in what you're seeing in your review and you'll actually see a, an expanded atb from us over the next couple of years part of what council has been interested in is when there are changes in your capital program naming those through adjustment to base so for example if we were planning to do a trailhead project and it got stuck in permitting our normal business practice would be, okay, what's the next trailhead project in the queue? Get that one going while we went on a permit. Um, what council is interested in seeing is, well, no, you made, a, you made a commitment to the community to do that specific site. And so they'd like to use the adjustment to base process to uh, name that to the community that there's been a change in the work plan. So we actually think you're going to see a ballooning <laughs> ATV from us um, over the next couple of years, just as we adjust to that process. Memo, which I found very interesting. There, there were some things in there that uh, I've never heard of or was, <laughs> wasn't aware of. And there seems to be some wide, fairly wide fluctuations year to year. Um, and just as an example, uh, this business use tax audit line, I've never heard of that. What, what is that? Yeah. And why do these numbers fluctuate so widely from year to year? Yeah, so those are those are actual audits that the finance department um, performs on our, our behalf. And so uh, we are part of, um, as you saw, we have the 0.77 tax increment. Um, so we're part of that larger picture of sales and use taxes for the whole city. And so we get some portion of, of these tax increments. And so you'll see that there's a one for business tax. There should be one for motor vehicle use tax, one for construction use tax. They have these different audit categories. We again, get some, some piece of, of that for the city. So those are city operations um, that we then get a part of as an outcome of whatever analysis or whatever, yeah, um, evaluation that they're doing. Yeah, and, and I think the, the narrative, typically when we talk about the open space tax, we talk about sales and use tax. Right. Retail sales tax is, is a very straightforward category. That's the example that you highlighted on the slide. These use taxes, construction, business use, motor vehicle use, they fluctuate um, significantly year to year. And a lot of that has to do with like economic conditions in Boulder, uh, permitting Construction use in particular varies based on, you know, what, what are those major uh, development projects that come through planning board that get approved. And, um, and so those, those are revenue lines for us every year, but in terms of our ability to, to predict, uh, they, they fluctuate greatly relative to retail sales. And then audit, this is something with the, the, the city launched a new sales and use tax remittance system a couple of years ago, which gave the finance department sort of an enhanced reporting and tracking ability. And so they're now staffed to be able to go follow up with businesses to ensure they're getting their collections and remittances to the city. So we've definitely seen an uptick in those audit revenue categories in the last couple of years since we launched that software. Okay, great. And then another question I have, just an example on the ag leases, it looks like, you know, there's a 17% decline. What, what, is the basis for that. Yeah, so we are in a, a draft phase of the 2022 budget. So basically um, our collections can also, are still being reported back to 2022. So we do expect to see that number to go up. Um, that's one of those areas that it's not necessarily surprising that it's negative change right now. Um, you know, when we see the final, final numbers over the next couple months, we should see that even out a bit. So it's not a projection, it's an actual? So yeah, yep. And that has to do with you know, December rent payments and things right. like that. And then the other thing we always partner with Andy and Lauren on is uh, when are when are these leases coming to a close and are we running application cycles? And so will we have some uh, some months where we're not collecting an ag lease while that is not in use while we, you know, determine the competitive outcome of a process. So there's 
there's always a little bit of a fluctuation there okay. through that process. Great. Well, this uh, this table reveals that there's there's far more uh, in revenue inputs than I uh, realized. So, and thanks. Uh, any other questions or comments? So uh, we'll expect to see the next iteration in what, June? In May. May okay. Yep, we'll be back in May, June, and July. Right, okay. Can I have one quick question? Sure. Okay, so Dan, what's your, how, how much, what's your involvement with the budget <clears throat> process and how, how has it worked best to be your board? I mean, obviously there's this huge, you guys have put a lot of thought into the process, mm -hmm. but like how much of your hands and fingerprints are on this and historically, how much does the board kind of monkey with it or, or yeah. I think you're the Excel brains, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's not true. That's, well, that's, I can answer that in a couple of questions. So I have over the last two and a half to three years, I've been very involved in the citywide budgeting process. They have a team called the executive budget team in which they have a rotating directors of certain departments every year serve on that. I think there's two ad hoc departments each year that, uh, and so I was serving on a, a three-year term on the citywide budgeting process, which is very time intensive. So uh, my term just ended today, actually. So, uh, actually, I found it fascinating. I'm just kind of sorry my term ended, but uh, so I have my hands on, on the citywide uh, budget processing. In terms of the development here, obviously we have day-to-day -day folks that are working on this, but we also have what we call a director's team, which is consists of our four deputy directors, our, our, our science officer with a new title forthcoming, and myself. And this team sort of takes all the work that our staff is doing, percolates it up, and then we have a number of meetings throughout the year, and sometimes our deputies are meeting month, uh, weekly on is this aligning with our work plan priorities? Is this aligning with master plan? Uh, and so we're supporting and uh, uh, Sam and Cole's work who's supporting our work and it's sort of an iterative process. So from the department leadership perspective, we're looking at prioritization decisions, uh, alignment decisions with uh, master plan priorities uh, and also staff capacity. Like, is this, are we really hitting a certain staff area hard where they're underwater and is there a way where we could do some adjustments to make sure things are evened out so we have the even capacity to take this work on so there's a lot of work at the leadership team level probably more so in the last year or two than previous we've sort of uh, have decided that as deputies and as a director we have our fingers in it anyway and so we're formalizing what that looks like so we have a pretty big role in it Yeah, no, I, and you're out, the other part of your question was around the, the board's role and across the city that varies greatly um, how different departments are engaging with their boards and commissions. Uh, when I got here, we, we saw it once, you voted on it that night and we really wanted to expand that. We were doing five months, now we're doing four, um, but we're also adding packets around like year end. We did the, the memo back in October on our point of sale programs and permit programs. And so we want to make sure that you're informed very regularly and involved in those things. Um, some of the things we've done are, we have 350 projects a year across the whole department. And so as we've talked about how to approach the board, we've, we've put those into some general buckets. Like we're always gonna have some, some conversation about ecological restoration, trail repair, trailheads, this sort of specifics around which trails we're gonna go do in any given year are less important. You know, we're really looking at, do we have the right policy level, strategic level, um, engagement for you all. Are, are we hitting it right in terms of the way we're prioritizing our work? Yeah, yeah thank, thanks for uh, offering that too. Yeah, so I would say at the individual project level, there's not a lot of boards directed to say, hey, eliminate that one project. We hope we're coming forward with telling you that we've been doing 12 months of that prioritization basing on uh, capacity at the uh, individual staff level and prioritization. But what we'd like to hear from you all is in terms of our big asset classes or our master plan priority tier one strategies, which we'll give you information on, do you feel like the allocation in these big bucket areas is right? Or if you would like us to start, uh, you know, enhancing one and maybe deaccelerating others, that might take a year to sort of get back to you and result in, but uh, love for you guys to be looking at the high level stuff of priority buckets and are we hitting it right? 
Yeah, I think the charter, for example, uh, calls for actually two major, you know, uh, responsibility areas for the board. One, one is disposal decisions on disposal of open space. The other is approval of the budget. So those two actions of the board are, are called out in the city charter. Yeah. The, the board's, you know, purview is, is, I mean, what we look at is really based, the details based on, you know, staff presentation ultimately we're responsible for approving it yeah well actually recommending yeah, yeah. <laughs> i just <laughs> recommending to council, <laughs> Re recommending, to, yeah. recommending to council and so if we hear concerns we'll try to adjust what we're hearing from the board before we present it to the city manager and then the city manager will take all the department and then bring that forward to council so it's sort of a three-step process we well, we'll start at the staff level, we'll get some feedback from the board, hopefully address your concerns, present it to the city manager through the EBT process, and then that goes onward to planning board and council. Thank you. Great, thanks you guys. Appreciate that, uh, looks good. And we'll look forward to next month. See you next month. Yeah. I know, I, I'm on it, I'm on it. <laughs> Brady's sitting there looking at the clock. I'm not asking any more questions. All right, Dan, you can have the final word. All right, no, a final five minutes, less than that. Just a couple of verbal updates really quick. I uh, just want to remind the board of our upcoming open house, which will be in person this year again, after about a three-year hiatus from in person. So really looking forward to that. That's April 25th in the evening here at the Hub will be, uh, and that's um, uh, sort of looking at this year of upcoming projects that will be daylighting to the public and we'll have booths that are, will be uh, staffed. And so if folks have questions on upcoming trail projects or upcoming ecological restoration projects or education uh, opportunities coming up, uh, volunteer, uh, we might have some master plan uh, materials available. So just a great chance for the public to interact with our program areas. We so, have some stuff for kids. Well, we have some stuff for kids. Yeah, 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 we actually do. Yeah. And, and let me just urge board members, uh, this is a real good opportunity to, you know, interact with the public, uh, you know, learn uh, specifically what's going on uh, as far as the upcoming work uh, program. And so if you can make it, which I unfortunately this year can't, but if you can make it, uh, yeah. great, be great. Great. I also want to call your attention to this Friday uh, is the 2023 Front Range Open Space Research Symposium. Uh, you may know that we run a small grants program to help get researchers uh, uh, looking at our system and uh, providing us with valuable data and information. And, every, uh, and I think it's every other year we uh, uh, have a symposium in which we invite some of the researchers to come in and tell us what they learned. And so we'll be uh, uh, 830 to 1230 at the University of Colorado Seek Lecture Room. You do have to register, but it's free. Um, just uh, looking for account. And this is a partnership project with City of Longmont, Jefferson County Open Space, Boulder County Parks and Open Space, and City of Boulder. And so, um, and plus, I'm doing an opening welcome <laughs> remark. So you got to come and cheer me on. <laughs> um, uh, next, I just want to give you a quick update. Uh, in March, we uh, 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 hosted uh, oh, about 13 uh, official representatives from 13 tribal nations uh, and uh, to come in and have a, uh, a two-day negotiation session with City of Boulder staff. I was uh, a lead in that. It was, it's always one of the highlights of the year. We're working towards uh, updating and renewing a memorandum of understanding that we have with over a dozen tribal nations uh, that, ha uh, that have a historical connection to the Boulder Valley. Um, it was a very successful meeting that at the end of the two days, we all sort of said, we think we're done with this uh, MOU. It's ready to go to the decision makers. So the tribal nations are bringing it back to their, their boards and uh, the MOU at some point will also go forward to city council. So we're super excited to uh, update that memorandum of understanding and we also uh, brought them out to a couple of city open space properties uh, that have uh, 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 ties to our tribal nations. And that was a very rewarding. We went to Jewel Mountain as well as the People's Crossing. So 
uh, a great couple of days uh, with them. And then we actually followed up on a Friday with three of the tribal nations continuing our work on developing a land management plan, plan for our Fort Chambers pork farm property uh, and had a meeting with them in which Dave uh, participated uh, in the opening for that. So thank you. Uh, and finally, with three minutes left, uh, uh, just want to call your attention that we are setting on that May 18th date for a field trip with the Open Space Board. Uh, the theme for uh, uh, May 18th is going to help support our upcoming summer discussions with you all on uh, uh, prairie dog uh, management uh, on irrigated agricultural lands. And so we will have staff out uh, and looking at a few different areas to help prep for uh, some memos you'll be getting and eventually a, a, some discussion with our staff on what we call the preferred alternative, which was a recommended management strategy that was adopted uh, in 2020 uh, that went to city council, that went to board, had a lot of community feedback. And we're doing a three-year assessment of that, some lessons learned, and that we could be recommending some tweaks to that plan. And so this field trip is geared to help support those conversations that we'll have upcoming with y'all. Okay, have you gotten the uh, responses from all the board members? Yes, positive all around, five. Great, great. Yep. So we'll get more information out to you on the details of, uh, of that. So those are my uh, verbal updates. Let me add just one more and then uh, at the stroke of nine, you know, <laughs> uh, this is just a reminder, May 4th and 5th, May, the evening of May 4th and May 5th, we will be having our retreat. Uh, the location for that uh, still remains to be determined and the location for the dinner uh, Thursday night remains to be determined, but uh, the time frames which uh, we're still working on will be five to eight, generally on Thursday night and uh, 8.30 to 2.30 Friday the next day. Uh, so anyway, uh, there will be additional information uh, coming as soon as we have it. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, is there any other, are there any other comments uh, for the good of the order? If not, um, this concludes the meeting of the Open Space Board of Trustees, April 12, 2023. And I I've, I've waited years to do that. And you're one for one ending yeah. on. Yeah. Uh,